файл one. to make anyone fall in love with you. Written and told by Leal Lounge. You smiled, perhaps cynically, when you saw the title of this tape, How to Make Anyone Fall in Love with You. That's a mighty big promise, you said. Indeed it is. But the promise of the title is yours. If you are willing to follow a scientifically sound plan to capture the heart of the man or woman you choose. Why, when history is strewn with broken hearts, do we now claim the means to make someone fall in love with us? Because, after centuries of resistance, science is finally unraveling what romantic love actually is, what triggers it, what kills it, and what makes it last. In the darkened Broadway theater in 1950, the audiences of South Pacific were in total harmony with Ezio Pinza when he pondered, who can explain it, who can tell you why? Fools give you reasons, wise men never try. Well, recently, many wise men and women have tried and succeeded. Don't blame Rodgers and Hammerstein. When they were composing romantic musicals, the scientific community was as perplexed about love as Nellie and Emile de Beck singing their bewilderment about some enchanted evening. Just as African tribesmen saw the eclipse and thought it was black magic, we looked at love and thought it was enchanted. But as we enter the 21st century, we are discovering that love is a definable and calculable blend of chemistry, biology, and psychology. And, well, maybe a little black magic thrown in. As science sets sail in previously unknown seas, we are at last beginning to understand the rudiments of that, quote, most insane, most elusive, and most transient of passions, as George Bernard Shaw described love, and what makes people want to stay in that excited, abnormal, and exhausting condition continuously until death do them part. Long before the days of Sigmund Freud, analytical scientific minds agreed that love was basic to the human experience. But their rational brains also deemed that Evaluating, classifying, and defining romantic love was impossible. Therefore, it was a waste of time and money. Freud went to his deathbed declaring, We really know very little about love. His dying words remained the scientific doctrine. At least until the early 1970s when a pioneer-spirited band of social psychologists took up the scientists' constant cry of why and how, they began asking themselves and everybody they could lure into their laboratories questions about love. It all started with two women psychologists who managed to wangle an $84,000 federal grant to study romantic love. They convinced the National Science Foundation to open their coffers by declaring, We already understand the mating habits of the stickleback fish. It's time to turn to a new species. Their study, like others before, might have gone unnoticed. But, fortunately for love seekers everywhere, one morning on Capitol Hill, Former United States Senator William Proxmire of Wisconsin was going through his papers. Buried deep in the pile was the NSF's frivolous grant to two women to study relationships. Proxmire hit the dome. $84,000 to study what? He dashed off an explosive press release announcing that romantic love was not a science. And furthermore, he roared, National Science Foundation, get out of the love racket. Leave that to Elizabeth Barrett Browning in Irving, Berlin. Proxmire then added a personal note. I'm also against it because I don't want the answer. He assumed everyone felt the same. How wrong he was. His reaction set off an international firestorm that raged around Burscheid for the next two years. Extra, extra, read all about it. National Science Foundation tackles love. Newspapers had a field day. Cameras and microphones zeroed in on Burscheid with gusto. The quiet researcher's office was swamped with mail. Proxmire's potshot at love had backfired. Instead of putting an end to the frivolous pursuit, 
his brouhaha generated tempestuous interest in the study of love. James Reston of the New York Times conceded that if they can, quote, find the answer to our pattern of romantic love, marriage, disillusions, divorce, and the children left behind, it will be the best investment of federal money since Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase. And ever since, there has been a torrent of studies scrutinizing every aspect of love. Recent science has given us a yet unopened gift, a gift we will unwrap now. The result of their labors, their studies, teach us, although that was not their purpose, how to make someone fall in love. Granted, some of their studies don't guide us directly to that goal, but to find the relevant studies, I combed through hundreds of scientific probings with cumbersome titles such as The Implications of Exchange Orientation on the Dyadic Functioning of Heterosexual Cohabitors. Huh? Some had mice listening to classical music and then jazz and blues to see which made them hornier. Happily, many of the studies bore tastier and more practical fruit. Especially helpful were the studies by an intrepid researcher named Timothy Perper, Ph.D., who spent many hours observing subjects in his favorite laboratory, called a singles bar. There were even courageous, if relatively unknown, researchers like a Carol Roni, who actually took a job as a table dancer in a topless bar to record what facial expressions turn men on. My own first-hand research, although less daring, was no less vigorous. For more than ten years before becoming a communications trainer, I was director of a research group I founded called The Project, a New York City-based, not-for-profit corporation established to explore sexuality and relationships. During my tenure with The Project, I interviewed and cataloged thousands of subjects on what they sought in a partner, we even had sessions where people dramatized their own erotic fantasies on stage. No nudity or explicit language, of course. The performance was followed by group discussions guided by guest therapists and counselors. The project, like the work of researcher Ellen Burscheid, experienced an unsought avalanche of publicity which brought it to national attention. A Time magazine reporter attended one of our sessions and wrote a full-page article declaring, Sex Fantasy Goes to Broadway which indeed it did. This in turn spawned network television coverage and dozens of articles in respected mainstream publications in America and Europe. As a result, people from all over the world called us or sent us their stories, their fantasies, their longings for love. We listened and read gratefully as we gathered data on what made, or would make, people fall in love. Let us leave the world of sexuality for a brief moment. Come with me to my second discipline, the field of communications, because it is here I take the findings and turn them into workable techniques to make someone fall in love with you. It has been proven beyond any doubt there are ways to induce desired behavior from people. If there were not, all psychologists and thousands of corporate trainers, myself included, would be out of business. There are established methods for invoking emotions and for changing people's behavior. For example, we have techniques to deal with difficult people, or techniques to make troublesome employees respond in the desired way. We accomplish this complex task by first understanding people's basic needs and motivations, then by employing the right verbal and nonverbal skills to modify their behavior. In this case, I give you the right verbal and nonverbal skills to make someone fall in love. Before sharing this information, however, I needed to see if these techniques would really work in the field. So several years ago, to test my theories, I created a seminar with the same title as my book, How to Make Anyone Fall in Love with You. Invitations flowed in from all over the country. And the feedback from my students is, yes, you can make someone fall in love with you. Is it a simple task? No. Does it require sacrifice? Yes. You may decide, after listening to this tape, that capturing his or her heart is simply not worth having to give up that much of yourself. But if you do want to proceed, follow me. We will explore the skills needed to accomplish the task to make the potential love partner of your choice fall in love with you. You notice that I use the words potential love partner. I will do so throughout the tape, because although it is bulkier, the phrase is more accurate than, quote, anyone, which my publisher wisely decided is more readable. Who are your potential love partners? First, a potential love partner, or PLP, 
is anyone who is ready for love. Timing, if not everything, at least counts. For example, if someone has just lost a beloved spouse, he or she may not be ready for love. That knocks him or her, temporarily, out of the PLP category. And second, a potential love partner is anyone free of esoteric psychological or love map needs. These are needs that through no fault of your own you can't fulfill. We'll talk a lot about love maps later. That leaves many potential love partners, a myriad of hearts to choose from. Now, let us step onto the path that leads you to the heart of the man or woman you desire. File 2 Audiobookforfree.com is financed by selling audio advertising between chapters of our MP3 books. Advertising space never exceeds 5% of book length. Children's books contain no advertising whatsoever. Out of the cascade of studies, six verities emerge about what makes people fall in love. And to be a successful hunter or huntress of hearts, you must, like Cupid, be a successful archer. You must aim your arrow dead center at the following six targets. Target 1. First Impressions The first moment you spot your potential love partner, let's call him your quarry, and he or she gets a glimpse of you, can be decisive. At that moment, your quarry subconsciously makes a go or no-go decision. Scientists tell us that love seeds are often sown during the first few minutes of a relationship. When two cats meet for the first time, they stop, they look at each other, and if one hisses, the other bristles his coat and hisses back. However, if the first kitten gives him a little nudge with her cold nose, the other kitten responds in kind, and they wind up purring together and licking each other's coats. A man and a woman getting to know each other are like two little animals sniffing each other out. We don't have tails that wag or hair that bristles, but we do have eyes that narrow or widen, and hands that flash knuckles or subconsciously soften in the palms-up I-submit position. We have dozens of other involuntary reactions that take place in the first few moments of interaction. The good news is, we can learn to control these presumed involuntary reactions. It is crucial, because you never get a second chance at love at first sight. The second element is similarity. If you pass the first impressions test, you enter another phase. Your partner's conscious mind starts to make judgments about you. Our hearts are finely tuned instruments which seek someone who has interests similar to ours, beliefs and values similar to ours, and who looks at the world in more or less the same way we do. We also look for people who enjoy the same activities so we can have fun together. Similarity is indeed a launch pad for a good relationship takeoff. But we get bored with too much similarity. And besides, we need somebody to make up for our lacks. If we have no head for mathematics, who's going to balance the checkbook? If we are sloppy, who's going to pick up our socks? So we also look for complementary qualities in a long-term love partner. But here's the rub. Not any complementary qualities. Only the ones we find interesting or that enhance our life. Hence, we seek someone who is both similar and complementary. We'll explore that in Section 2. Section 3 gets ugly. Hey, baby, everybody's got a market value. Everybody wears a price tag. How pretty is she? How much prestige does he have? How blue is her blood? How much power does he wield? Are they rich? Intelligent? Nice? And what can they do for me? Researchers tell us love is not really blind, and everybody, even the nicest people, have a touch of crass when it comes to choosing a long-term partner. It's no different than in the business world, where everybody asks, Wiffem, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? I can almost hear some of you protesting, but no, love is pure and compassionate. It involves caring, altruism, communion, and selflessness. That's what love is all about. And yes, that's what love is all about when good people are truly in love. You've probably even met couples who are deeply devoted and would sacrifice everything for each other. Yes, this kind of selfless love that we all dream of having exists. 
but it comes later, much later, and it comes only after you've made them fall in love with you. The fourth target involves, you knew it was coming, ego. Perhaps Cupid misses the mark when he aims his little arrow at Quarry's hearts. Science shows us where to really level our ammunition and take fire, right at their ego. It's more complicated than you might think. A skillful ego massage is not just giving compliments. It is gaining a thorough understanding of your quarry's self-image and then fostering it, because people fall in love with people in whose eyes they behold the most ideal reflection of themselves. Where we run into even more trouble is number five, gender differences. Back in 1956, audiences smiled knowingly when Rex Harrison moaned from the Broadway stage, Oh, why can't a woman be more like a man? He knew his fair lady was a very different animal indeed. But in the following era, feminists threw serious doubt upon his convictions. Now, after many decades of pondering, presuming, and postulating on whether men and women really differ in anything but their genitals, the envelope has been opened. And the answer is... Drum roll, please. Yes. Men and women think and communicate in dramatically different ways. Neurosurgeons can point to clumps of neurons in the female brain that cause men like Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady to call women exasperating, calculating, agitating, maddening, and infuriating. Scientists aim their needles at the molecules in the male brain that make women accuse men of being insensitive clods. In spite of the torrent of data flowing in about the genetic, cerebral, and sexual differences between men and women, both hunters and huntresses continue to assume we think alike, and we persist in courting each other in the way we'd like to be courted. Serious big game hunters, so they don't scare their quarry off before they bag them, know all the characteristics and habits of deer, moose, caribou, bison, and wild hogs. Likewise, serious love hunters and huntresses must be well-versed in gender differences if they intend to make the kill. Finally, target six. If we have time, we'll talk about sex. Of course we'll have time. We'll make time. Many books on how to turn your partner on make sex sound like flipping the switch on the nightlight next to your bed. Press here to speed up orgasm. Stroke there for an extra charge. Yes, sexuality is electricity, but your quarry's bodily switches only speed up or slow down their physical functions. Mind power is what drives the mighty machine and keeps it generating heat for many years. The most erotic organ in your quarry's body is his or her brain. Gentlemen, far more important for a woman than how many times you can do it in a week or even a night is the sensuality and passion that you create in every aspect of your relationship and the sensations you give her every time you look at her or touch her hand. Ladies, Far more important to a man than your bra cup size or the curve of your hips is the curve and the size of your sexual attitude and how you deal with his individual sexuality. No two sexualities are alike, just like no two snowflakes are alike. I will give you techniques to uncover your quarry's unique sexuality and then make love to him or her just the way he or she likes it. But if we are going to follow our six-step scientific plan, we must understand a little groundwork. First, what happens physically when someone falls in love? Let us examine what happens to your quarry's body when he or she starts to feel that incredible sensation called love. At the core of infatuation, scientists speculate, is a chemical called phenylethylamine, or P, spelled P-E-A. P is the hormone secretion which flows through our nervous system and bloodstream, when we feel the first sensations of falling in love. This PEA chemical can make your heart palpitate, your hands sweat, and your insides go all funny. In fact, P is a chemical cousin of amphetamines, and it gives a similar kick. It's as close to a natural high as the body can get. Cole Porter obviously knew what he was singing about when he wrote, I get a kick out of you. The bad news is that the kick doesn't last forever. This adds to the quickly mounting scientific evidence that romantic love is relatively short-lived. That's why some people become love junkies. They crave more and more and more of that wonderful sensation. The good news is that it does last long enough to kickstart great love affairs. 
Its average one-and-a-half to three-year duration is plenty of time to have a fantastic fling. Get him or her to say I do, and or propagate the species. Now, since you can't go around armed with a syringe filled with phenylethylamine, spot your quarry, and inject the pee-filled tube into his or her bloodstream, you do the next best thing. You develop techniques to trigger pea-brained responses in people and give them the sensation that they are falling in love. Why do some people make us go pea-brained and others leave us cold? Why do we fall in love with one person and not another? People just don't mysteriously wake up one morning with an overdose of pee in their brain and then develop a crush on the next person they happen to set eyes on. No, pee and its sister chemicals are precipitated by emotional and visceral responses to a specific stimulus. Like what? It can be a whiff of her perfume, the boyish way he says hello, the way she wrinkles her nose when she laughs. It could even be an article of clothing you're wearing that revs up your quarry's engines. For example, in 1924, Conrad Hilton, the founder of the Hilton Hotel chain, flipped over a red hat sitting five pews in front of him in church. After the services, he followed the red hat down the street and eventually married the lady walking under it. Why do these seemingly meaningless stimuli kickstart love? Where do they come from? Are they in our genes? No, genes have nothing to do with falling in love. The origin lies deeply buried in our psyche. The ammunition that gets fired off when we see, hear, smell, feel something we like is lying dormant in our subconscious. It springs from that seemingly bottomless well that most of our personality rises up from, our childhood experiences. Most significantly, what happens to us between the tender ages of five and eight? When we are very young, a type of subconscious imprinting takes place. It is similar to the phenomenon that occurs in certain species of the animal kingdom. During the 1930s, an eminent Austrian ethologist, Dr. Conrad Lorenz, observed that baby ducklings, shortly after hatching, began to waddle along in single file behind their mother, and they continued to do so until maturity. The clever Dr. Lorenz decided to see if he could imprint the ducklings with himself. He hatched a cluck of duck eggs in an incubator. At first the sight of their little beaks breaking through the eggshell, he squatted low as though he were a mother duck, and he waddled past the eggs. They promptly broke free and followed him across the laboratory. Thereafter, despite the presence of real female ducks, these imprinted little ducklings continued to waddle after Dr. Lawrence on every possible occasion. Are humans immune to imprinting? Well, like the duped ducklings queued up behind Dr. Lawrence, we don't continue to crawl after the doctor who delivered us until we reach adulthood. But there is strong evidence that we fall prey to another kind of imprinting and early sexual imprinting. Universally respected sexologist Dr. John Money coined the term love map for this phenomenon. Our love maps are carvings of pain or pleasure axed in our brains in early responses to our family members, our childhood friends, and our chance encounters. And the cuts are so deep that they fester forever in some nook or cranny of the human psyche, just waiting to bleed again when the proper stimulus strikes. Dr. Money said, Love maps? They're as common as faces, bodies, and brains. Each of us has one. Without it, there would be no falling in love, no mating, and no breeding of the species. Your quarry has a love map. You have a love map. We all have a love map, indelibly etched into our egos, our ids, our psyches, our subconscious. They can be positive imprintings. For example, perhaps your mother wore a certain perfume. Your beloved father had a boyish grin, or your favorite teacher scrunched up her nose when she laughed. Perhaps a beautiful lady in a red hat was kind to little Connie Hilton when he was growing up in San Antonio, New Mexico. But they can be negative, too. Women, maybe, tragically, you were molested as a child, so now you can never love a man with a leering smile. Men, maybe your cruel, wicked aunt wore joy perfume, so now any woman who gives you a whiff of joy makes you want to flee like a bug blasted with insect repellent. Forgotten experiences, both positive and negative, are remembered by your sexual subconscious. And if the timing is right, and someone triggers one, blam! A shot of pee shoots through your veins. It blasts your brain, blinding you to reason. And you begin to fall in love. And if he or she feels that same blam, it's love at first sight. Love at first sight? Let's talk about that. Does it really exist? Well, science passes it off as a semantic question. 
instant desire or lust at first sight definitely exists. However, the scientific world pretty well agrees that love at first sight is merely hindsight. The professional journal Medical Aspects of Human Sexuality reports, quote, A successful love affair, perhaps one leading to marriage, is retrospectively declared to be true love, whereas if one is rebuffed, it is classified as infatuation. So yes, it is a semantic point, but one fact remains. If from that powerful stimulus of first impressions, love grows, and the result is a long-term relationship or even marriage, you have every right to call it love at first sight, and nobody will argue with you. In the same way that a voodoo curse causes death only in persons who believe in its power to kill them, love at first sight truly exists for those who believe in it. Now let's get into the concrete techniques for the first crucial element to make someone fall in love with you. If you are following in the book, you will notice that some of the technique numbers are different or have been synthesized, because all 85 techniques from the book would take a full day to listen to. But in these three hours, I will give you 30 of the best techniques to make the man or woman of your choice fall in love with you. File 3 Audiobookforfree.com has a special section designed to be used by blind and visually impaired listeners. Enjoy the colorful world of our audiobooks. Crucial element number one to make your quarry fall in love with you. Making a dynamite first impression. Those first few seconds your quarry lays eyes on you has awesome potency. The picture burns its way into his or her eyes and can stay emblazoned in your quarry's memory forever. I have a dear friend, an older gentleman named Gerald, who is very sought after in the social scene of his hometown. He is a charming escort for several elderly ladies who have long ago lost their husbands. He met these women when they were all in high school back together in the late 1940s. His women friends are inwardly beautiful, but physically several have gained weight and have long since lost their youthful attractiveness. Once at a party, I overheard a very rude man tease Gerald about his, quote, taste in women. My friend was genuinely confused at the tactless remark. But they are all beautiful, he exclaimed. Gerald reached into his wallet and pulled out an old dog-eared black-and-white photograph. It was of his high school homecoming queen and her court. See, he said to the man. Two of the three ladies he was currently escorting were in the photo. One of them was the homecoming queen. To this day, my friend saw his lady friends as beautiful as they were back in 1948. Such is the power of first impressions. So the question comes to mind. Why do we spend so much time grooming ourselves for a date when, by that time, first impressions are already formed? One in five Americans is single and searching, American Demographics magazine tells us. That means there are 49 million Americans, age 25 and older, who are single, widowed, or divorced. Potential love partners are everywhere looking for love, just like you. PLPs are sitting in the park munching a blimpy, enjoying music at a concert, buying a newspaper, walking their dog, riding the commuter train, and going to restaurants all around you. Technique number one. Dress for the kill everywhere. I Men, this does not mean you have to don your three-piece suit to buy the newspaper. Women, it does not mean you have to slap on three coats of mascara to walk the dog. What it does mean is, whenever you step out the door, step out dressed to make the kill. Not only should you be physically ready, but you must keep your mental doors open to let love walk in wherever you are. I have a friend a nail tech who has been doing my nails for some years. It's the same conversation we have every time I have my nails done. Cindy gripes to me that in her line of work, all she meets is women. And there must be some drug and nail polish remover that dissolves women's inhibitions and induces them to spill every detail of their life as they hold hands across the manicure table. Anyway, I had a late appointment with Cindy one evening at 6 o'clock. She was again telling me how after a long day of clipping, filing, and painting, She's too tired to go out to try to meet someone. At about 6.45 p.m., the door opens behind Cindy's back. 
we both hear a deep male voice saying, Excuse me, I know it's terribly late, but is it possible to get a manicure? I look up over Cindy's shoulder and behold, a Greek god! Before I can pull my jaw back up, Cindy, not even turning around, says, Nah, we close in ten minutes. How do you like that? She grumbles without even looking up from my hangnail as he walks out. Who does he think he is to march in here at this hour and expect a manicure? Then, Cindy hears a jaguar revving up outside her window. Now, Cindy's ears are very finely tuned to such sounds as expensive sports cars. She jumps up to look, and there is her Adonis careening out of the parking lot and out of her life forever. Cindy didn't stop kicking herself long enough for me to respectfully suggest that one should keep one's eyes open all the time for such opportunities. Technique number two, stay psychologically fit to kill. Big game hunters lay bear traps even before they spot the bear. Fishermen cast nets long before the swarm swims their way. And if you set your psychological trap the minute your feet hit the floor in the morning, chances are the next big one won't get away. The next question is, when I see the person I want to fall in love with me, what should I do? You don't need science to tell you that you cannot make someone fall in love with you unless the two of you are introduced. Unless, of course, you engineer their acquaintance without the benefit of introduction. In the vernacular, that's called pick them up. Proponents of politically correct would recoil at that phrase. But I, for one, have nothing against the concept if the pickup is done in a manner, shall we say, befitting the situation and the individuals involved. Let us now explore the scientifically proven best first way to meet someone of the opposite sex. Biologists, as they watch animals spotting each other, sniffing, growling, hissing, nuzzling, and finally copulating, observe the same courtship patterns over and over. Identical patterns of proceptivity and aggression repeat themselves time and time again. And if the pattern is broken, often copulation does not take place. It's no different with Homo sapiens. That's us. But we operate with a handicap. Unlike in lower animals, our brains get in the way of our instincts. We think too much. We ask ourselves too many questions. Will he think I'm forward? Should I play hard to get? Is my tie straight? Maybe I should go to the ladies' room and put on some more lipstick first. Or shyness takes over and paralyzes us, like a deer frozen in car headlights. Rabbits have no such reflections. Nor should we when we spot our quarry. We must merely follow what research tells us are the right moves. Both men and women are infinitely more drawn to someone who instantly likes them. In several studies, men and women who didn't know each other were told, falsely, by researchers, that another participant liked them. When later questioned whom they liked in the group, practically every participant chose someone of the opposite sex who supposedly liked them. Now, unfortunately, you don't have a researcher whispering in your quarry's ear how much you like them. So you must demonstrate that all on your own. Since saying, I like you, sounds a tad abrupt in words, leave it to your body to do the talking for you. Science documents that the early body language of both partners is crucial to whether love will develop or not. One of the most tireless researchers in the laboratory of love was Dr. Timothy Perper, he spent more than 2,000 grueling hours perched on stools of singles bars, tirelessly scrutinizing men, women, and their early courting moves. Like researchers tracking the mating habits of hamsters, Dr. Perper spotted the identical courtship pattern repeatedly in his singles bars laboratory. Night after night, he stayed resolutely at his post, scribbling notations, devising charts, and hypothesizing formulas as men and women picked each other up. Then, in the finest scientific tradition, he broke the body language pattern of couples getting to know each other into very specific steps, which became known as the dance of intimacy. Broken down into its simplest form, the dance of intimacy begins with a nonverbal signal, a glance, a, a smile, a wink across the room, then moving closer together and a verbal signal. Hi, do you come here often? Are you enjoying the party? Anything. In between is a gradual turning towards each other, first head to head, then belly to belly, knees to knees, feet to feet, leaning forward, showing acceptance of the other. 
Dr. Purper found that if either partner broke the sequence by not responding warmly to each overture, even accidentally, the couple drifted apart. Now some specifics. Gentlemen first, say you're at a party and you spot a lady who has love partner potential. Should you go right up to her and introduce yourself? Well, of course, you say. What's wrong with that? Here's what's wrong. Studies have shown that there is so much of what is called brain clutter going on when two people meet each other. She needs time to size you up when she first sees you. Does she like your looks? Your manner? Your posture? Your clothes? She doesn't have time to metabolize all that and your spoken words at the same time and make a thoughtful decision on how she wants to react. So, gentlemen, when you spot an attractive lady, what's the best strategy? Let your eyes do the work first. One, make eye contact. Catch her glance across the room and hold your eye contact for a few extra seconds. Number two, smile at her. Make sure your smile is friendly, respectful, not a leering grin or a salacious smirk. Now, gentlemen, be prepared for her to look away. A lady will always lower or avert her eyes when a man looks at her. This does not mean she is not interested. Now, gentlemen, here is a trick. Quickly check the second hand on your watch. If she looks up again at you within 45 seconds, it means she welcomes your attentions. And at the moment she looks up, you must be looking at her or she loses interest. And heaven forbid you should be glancing at another woman when she looks up. That's your swan song with her. So as she coyly feigns interest in something else in the room, clock how long it takes for her to glance back at you. If it's within 45 seconds, proceed as follows. Step 3. Nod slightly. The nod reads, I like you. May I make a reservation to talk with you? Think of it as making a reservation at a table at an exclusive restaurant. When you've signaled a woman's attention, you've made your reservation to talk with her. Step 4. Move within her range. You are now in position for conversation. What should you say to her? After my seminars, many a shy hunter has asked me, Well, what's a good opening line? Fellas, there is no such thing as a good opening line. In fact, far more significant than what you say is how you look and how you say whatever you say. Gentlemen, your opening words should relate to the woman or the current situation. Ask her what time it is. Compliment her watch. Ask her directions. Inquire how she knows the host or the hostess of the party. In fact, the less clever your opener, the better. Because this early in the relationship, she is not metabolizing your words. She's checking you out. Whatever you say, she knows it's just an excuse to talk to her. And if she likes you, that's fine with her. Although you should not memorize any line, do pay attention to the first words which flow from your lips. Like the first glimpse of you should please your quarry's eyes, your first words should delight her ears. Remember, after you have said just one sentence to your quarry, that is 100% of her sampling of you so far. If you open with a complaint, in her book, you're a complainer. If you open with a conceited remark, she labels you a bragger. But if your first words charm her, you are charming. That, Huntress, goes both ways. But, gentlemen, conversation is rougher for you at first because men often forget that times have changed. In times gone by, a woman had to be impressed with your muscles or your speed and know you could go out in the jungle and trap a wild pig for dinner. But many women today can afford their own pork pate at a fancy restaurant. So the name of the game is no longer impress a woman. It's show how impressed you are with her. Let's review. Technique number three for hunters. Smart moves. One, make eye contact. Two, when she looks at you, smile at her. She will, of course, look away. But three, if she returns your gaze within the decisive 45 seconds, nod slightly. Four, move within her range, close enough to talk. Five, say something pleasant, respectful, not overly clever, and then take time to explore her personality. Now you're into your first conversation, and we'll get more details on that shortly. But first, huntresses, what should you do when the possible love of your life makes the approach? Play slightly hard to get? 
Absolutely not. Actual laboratory studies have shown that does not work. You must make the man feel immediately accepted. No matter how cool and self-assured he may seem to you, chances are there is a little shy boy hiding inside. Most of us women were weaned on boosting the male ego. Perhaps some chemical in mother's milk told us to kowtow to all the men in our life. By age five, we had already learned what worked. Oh, Daddykins, you're so wonderful. I know you'll buy me that Barbie doll. Then something happened. We grew up. Some of us became feminists. But like throwing out the baby with the wash, many women threw out the, oh, you're so wonderful, attitude along with their tattered baby dolls. The modern woman feels she needs to express her capability, her independence, her superintelligence right away. Wrong. There is plenty of time to show a man these qualities later. And you must if you want to have a good relationship with mutual respect. But now is not the time. Now is the time to make the man feel you think he's just absolutely, positively wonderful. Women, use the technique I call the big baby pivot. Picture yourself now sitting on a stool, and an adorable little four-year-old boy walks up to you and says, Hi, my name is Willie. Well, you turn around, you smile at the kid, you open up, you lean forward, you give him a big hello, Willie. You definitely show how pleased you are that he came up and said hello. Sisters, men are all big babies. Technique number four for huntresses, the big baby pivot. Huntresses, whenever a man approaches you, picture him as a, a big baby. Pivot toward him, accept his approach like you're welcoming an adorable little child. If you want him to continue, give him the nice, warm, willy welcome. Now, really successful huntresses don't even wait for the man to make the first move. You may think the responsibility for, quote, picking you up rests on the man's shoulders. But surprisingly enough, research shows that women initiate two-thirds of all encounters. This, too, is part of nature's grand design. In the animal kingdom, wannabe lovers attract each other by hooting, crowing, or stomping the ground. They are more overt than us homo sapiens. A female chimpanzee in heat will spot her quarry, stroll up to the male, and tilt her buttocks toward his nose to get his attention. She'll bare her teeth and make some noise like, hee, hee, hee. Then she'll actually pull him up to his feet to copulate. This behavior is known as Female proceptivity. Female proceptivity, as opposed to receptivity, is not unknown to our species, although we are hopefully a little less obvious. File 4. Audiobookforfree.com would like audiobooks producers and publishers to place their existing audiobooks or plays into our website. We will generate advertising income using those books and we will share this income with all contributors. To see how successful meetings really took place, a woman researcher put hidden cameras in the ceiling of a party of 200 men and 200 women who didn't know each other. Afterward, in analyzing the film, every time a man approached a woman, she backed up the film. And there she saw that two-thirds of the time, it was the woman who incited the male. How do women initiate counters? The same way kids do it. The same way the birds and the bees and all the wonderful animals in God's kingdom do it. With an attention-getting device. A smile, perhaps a wink. Research has shown that dancing alone to the music, even touching your neck while smiling at him has a powerful effect. Incidentally, throw all old-fashioned rules right out the window. Talk to him first. Don't worry about his brain clutter. A man goes temporarily brain-dead when an attractive woman approaches him anyway. Sisters, do not be hesitant about making the first move. If you need more courage, think of it this way. Female choice is an evolutionary mandate given to woman. 
so she may select the best mate and thus assure the survival of the species. You are merely fulfilling your instinctive destiny when you overtly lure the handsome stranger. Mother Nature would approve. Still shy? Do you feel he'll think you are too forward if you smile broadly at him in the crowd or accidentally brush up against him? You won't, because happily the male ego takes over retroactively. Ten minutes later, he won't even realize that it was not he who made the initial overture. Again, in the interest of adding my own research to the established findings, I decided to give it a try. I was dining alone recently at one of the ubiquitous TGIF restaurants in upstate New York, where I was giving a talk the next day to a singles group. As I was finishing dinner, I was running the next day's seminar program over in my mind. In my talk, I had planned to do a segment on the smile, in which I would tell women how important it is to smile at a man she'd like to get to know. Then I thought to myself, Leo, you hypocrite. Tomorrow morning you'll be telling women to have the courage to smile at handsome, safe-looking strangers, and you don't even have the nerve to do it yourself? While ruminating over this, I spotted a great-looking man reading while finishing his dinner a few tables from me. I thought, Okay, Lil, courage. Let's try it. So I smiled at handsome stranger. The poor chap looked a little stunned, and he dove his astonished nose back into his book. But soon after, he looked up again. I smiled again. Once more, his nose disappeared into his reading material. A few minutes later, handsome stranger got up and walked past my table to go to the men's room. As he passed, I forced myself to smile yet again. The perplexed fellow kept on walking, scratching his head. But then it got interesting. On the way back from the men's room, he walked very slowly by my table. Once more, I looked up at him, and you guessed it, I smiled. Handsome stranger stopped walking. After the flood of smiles I drowned him in, it was perfectly logical to start chatting, as though we had been formally introduced. He joined me at my table for coffee. Well, I invited this gentleman, his name was Sam, to attend my seminar the next morning, which he did. And, to illustrate the smile part of my seminar, I told the audience the story, without revealing his identity, of course, of how my smile engineered a meeting with a lone diner. After the seminar, Sam came up to me and said, You know, Leo, love, that was an interesting story you told about meeting a man in a TGIF restaurant. I uh, suppose it was me you were talking about? Yes, Sam, it was you, I said. But, he added, looking thoroughly confused and quite sincere, I thought it was I who made the approach to you. Sure, Sam. So I tell you, sisters, the male ego is a wondrous thing. Have the courage to smile broadly, nod, point to a chair, invite him to sit, or choose almost any corny, obvious maneuver, and he will take credit for the successful meeting. He will forget that he didn't make the first approach. Technique number five for huntresses. Make the first move. Huntresses, when you spot possible quarry, nature decrees that you must make the first move. Do not wait for his approach. You go ahead and smile, wink, or dance alone to the music while looking at him flirtatiously. It's as close to jabbing his buttocks with a syringe filled with pee as you can get. If it doesn't work, you go up and talk to him. Now I'd like to share a few more physical techniques to kickstart love before we get into the specifics of conversation. Here's a way to start making your quarry's insides go all funny over you. Let's start with two of the most potent weapons you have to trigger love at first sight. They're right above your nose. Many lovers swear, I fell in love the moment I looked into his or her eyes. A man may be classified as a, a breast man or a leg man. Incidentally, guess what part of the male anatomy a British study determined all women look at? Hint, they do it as he's walking away. You guessed it. Women are incurable buns watchers. But researchers have ascertained that everybody is an eye person. Powerful eye contact immediately stimulates strong feelings of affection. This was proven once and for all in a study called The Effects of Mutual Gaze on Feelings of Romantic Love. Researchers put 48 men and women who didn't know each other in a big room. They gave them directions on how much eye contact to have with their partners during casual conversation. Afterwards, 
The researchers asked each participant how he or she felt about the various people they had spoken with. The results? The Journal of Research and Personality reports, quote, Subjects who were gazing at their partner's eyes and whose partner was gazing back reported significantly higher feelings of affection than subjects in any other condition. Let's say that in less technical language. When you lock eyeball to eyeball with the attractive stranger, it helps put the match to the flame of love. Why does eye contact have such fiery consequences? Unrelenting eye contact creates a high emotional state similar to fear. When you look directly and potently into someone's eyes, their body produces chemicals like phenylethylamine. That's the one we spoke about called P that jolts the sensations of being in love, thus making strong, almost threateningly intense eye contact with your quarry is one of the first steps in making them fall in love with you. How long do you have to look into their baby blues or browns or grays or greens? A British scientist determined that on the average, when talking, people look at one another only 30 to 60 percent of the time. This is not enough to rev up the engines of love at first sight. A prominent researcher named Zick Rubin, in his study on the, quote, measurement of romantic love, found that people who are deeply in love gaze at each other much more while talking, and they are slower to look away when someone intrudes upon their world. He confirmed this through a trick experiment. He asked dating couples a long series of questions so he could first rate the pairs on how much they loved each other. The couples, unaware of their rating, were then put in a waiting room and told, The experimenter will be with you shortly to start the experiment. Unbeknownst to them, that was the experiment. Hidden cameras recorded how much time the couple spent staring into each other's eyes. The higher the couple had scored on the loving each other test, the more time they spent looking at each other, the less love they felt for each other, the fewer number of seconds they made eye contact. So, to give your quarry the subliminal sense that the two of you are already in love, a self-fulfilling prophecy, dramatically increase your eye contact while the two of you are chatting. Push it up to 75% of the time or more if you want to get the pee gushing through their veins. Gentlemen, it works especially with women. Intense eye contact awakens those primal, unsettling, sexy feelings in your quarry, that blissfully nervous feeling that floods over people when they start to fall in love. Several years ago, I hired a carpenter to put an additional window in my office. Now, Jerry wasn't terribly good-looking, and he was certainly no mental giant, but for some strange reason, I found this carpenter very attractive. There was a indefinable, mysterious quality about Jerry. It was unsettling, primal, sexy. I didn't permit myself to indulge in my little infatuation, however. Perhaps it was because seducing him was neither professionally correct nor otherwise desirable under the circumstances, or perhaps it was because Jerry's other qualities weren't emblazoned on my love map. However, thoughts of Jerry filled my fantasies for weeks. Then I didn't see Jerry for several years. But just recently, while working on how to make anyone fall in love with you, I needed shelves to hold my research materials. So, naturally, I called Jerry. There I am, 8 o'clock Saturday morning, putting on makeup as though I were going to try to make the kill. Anyway, Jerry arrives on my doorstep, 10 pounds heavier, 3 years older, but just as sexy. However, this time, thanks to my recent research, Five minutes into our conversation, I realized why he had turned me on. Every time I said something, Jerry's eyes lingered on mine. After I had finished speaking, even during the silences, his eyes stayed glued to mine. That quality, I realized, is what I had found so unsettling and primal and sexy. As our discussion about my shelves progressed, I also realized why he was holding the eye contact longer. He wasn't trying to be sexy. He wasn't fascinated by me. It wasn't because he couldn't take his eyes off me. It wasn't because he knew the technique. It was simply because Jerry took an extra beat for my I'd like the shelves 11 inches wide to sink into his brain because Jerry wasn't all that bright. Technique number six. Sticky eyes. When conversing with your quarry, exaggerate your eye contact. Search for their optic nerve. Lock eyes with your quarry to give the aura of already being in love. 
And gentlemen, whenever you are talking with your quarry, let your eyes stay glued to hers just a little longer, even during the silences. When you must look away, do so reluctantly. Drag your eyes away from hers, as though they had been stuck with warm taffy. Now, gentlemen, a warning. If the lady is not attracted to you, this can be really obnoxious. You'll come across as a stalker. But if she's attracted to you, I promise she will find it very exciting. And now we come to another way our eyes can get the chemicals flowing through your quarry's veins. This is the one women can use to more powerful advantage. A curious phenomenon happens to our eyes when a man and woman begin to feel comfortable with each other and the rumblings of love start to resonate through their bodies. As lovers are lulled by the good feelings, their eyes become ever more courageous. Instinctively, inadvertently, their eyes start to wander lovingly over each other's faces, hair, necks. Then they become bolder, and their eyes venture down to their partner's shoulders. A dreaminess sets in. To push your relationship with a new quarry to this next step of intimacy, use the technique I call a visual voyage. As the conversation progresses, let your eyes slide slowly down your quarry's nose to their lips. Caress their lips with your eyes for a moment or two, then slowly venture south to their neck. Gentlemen, that's where you stop. Anything below the neck and you're cruising into dangerous seas. You can sink the ship if your eyes travel too far south and vacation there too long. But ladies, if all is going well, you can travel beyond, way beyond. Let your eyes drift right down to his chest back and forth, even lower to his tummy, then down to his belt buckle, no farther, then look back up into his eyes and give him a big approving smile like you really liked what you saw. This is guaranteed to get those sexy feelings running through his system. File 5 Audiobookforfree.com provides advertisers with a mechanism to put their adverts to the relevant listener according to the listener's hobbies and lifestyle. Adverts heard with our books will be of more interest and relevance to the individual listener than traditional radio adverts. Technique number seven, a visual voyage. As you and your quarry are chatting, let your eyes do some traveling. Take a visual voyage all over their face, concentrating mostly on their eyes. Women, you have a more liberal passport to travel farther. Men, stop at the shoulders. Now, both of you, after your eyes have taken this little sojourn, look back into his or her eyes and give a big, warm smile of appreciation for the wonders your eyes have just beheld. These two eye techniques, sticky eyes and visual voyage, are scientifically proven aphrodisiacs when you meet your quarry. Like any new habit, it takes a little courage at first, but when you start using them, you will definitely feel the effects. Now, let us venture into deeper waters where even very smart women and men drown. The first conversation and the first date. Conversation is like making love. When you are making love to a new partner for the first time, you can gently ask, Am I doing it the way you like? Um, is there anything else you want? But you can't ask a new PLP. Is the conversation good for you too, honey? Think of your first conversation as an audition piece to see what role, if any, you will play in your quarry's life. You can get away with boring interludes later in a relationship, but not now. Your first discussion has to be a smooth flow of electricity if it's going to ignite a relationship. What is exhilarating conversation? To some quarry, it's talking about sports, theater, ballet. For others, it's discussing philosophy, psychology, or nuclear fission. And many people find chatting about their home, their car, their family, their dog, or their parakeet to be the most engrossing dialogue by far. You need techniques to discover your quarry's hot buttons to make your first conversation memorable for him or her. When you are in bed together the first few times, you don't know where she likes to be caressed, where he loves to be touched. How rough does he or she like it? How gentle? So you pick up hints. You watch their body, their facial expressions. You listen to her little moans, his involuntary gasps. You may sense that she goes crazy whenever you kiss her breasts. 
Of course, you kiss him some more. Maybe he pulled away when you nibbled his thighs, so you don't take any more bites on that tender tissue. Be just as sensitive in early chats with a new quarry. Your first conversational interchange is every bit as important as first sexual experiences together. Maybe even more significant, because the latter may never happen if the former isn't good. The trick is to watch your partner during the discussion. Like a good salesperson, watch their reactions. When they close off, when they open up, when they smile, when they frown, when their eyes light up, when they go dead. It's so frustrating to be chatting with attractive stranger and get stuck in the small talk rut. You are silently screaming out, Gosh, I like you. I hope you like me, too. Here we are making chit-chat, but I want our discussion to be more interesting, more meaningful. What would you really like to talk about? I've developed a surefire technique to transition out of small talk and get onto a subject that is closer to your new quarry's heart. I call it cherry-picking. While your quarry is making small talk, scoop up any unusual references in their conversation, any anomaly, any deviation, any digression, or any invocation of another time, another place, another person. Pick that word out, because it is your key to know what your quarry would really like to talk about. Say you're talking about the weather. It's been raining a lot, and in typical small talk, you might say, uh, rough weather, huh? And she responds, small talk, you think. Well, it's been good for the plants. To the savvy hunter, that's the cue. Perhaps you wouldn't know a daffodil from a dandelion, but obviously plants are a part of your new quarry's life, or she wouldn't have used the word. Subconsciously, even unbeknownst to her, she was crying out, I really prefer to discuss plants. After she threw out that chair, you should have asked, Oh, do you have a garden? Well, maybe she has a vegetable garden, a roof garden, a hanging garden, or a victory garden. Maybe she has no garden at all, but she just loves plants. You don't know yet, but you do know that plants are somehow a part of her world. Otherwise, the word wouldn't have slipped out of her lips. Now, suppose instead of saying, well, it's good for the plants, she had said, I know it's like a tropical storm, isn't it? Your quarry has just given you the cherry that saves the conversation. This time it's tropical storm. Say, oh, have you been to the tropics? Chances are she has, or at least has a knowledge of them, or it wouldn't have welled up from her subconscious when discussing the rain. The tropics to you may just be a way to describe a storm, but to the person who uttered the words it has a more intense connection. Learn how to be a word detective. Suppose she had said, Because of the rain, my dog can't go out. Or, Yes, the rain has been dropping leaves in my pool. In this case, dog or pool are your tickets to hotter conversation, at least for attractive stranger. You will never be stuck for good discussions with your quarry if you pick up on their conversational cherry. Technique number eight, cherry picking. Listen for any slightly unusual word. That's your cherry seed. Plant it and watch it flower into a memorable first conversation for your quarry. Now the game begins in earnest as you contemplate your first date. Starting with the first time you go out together, he or she looks at you through the eyes of an Olympic judge. Everything you say and do can give you points, or ruin your chances at the gold medal, their heart. It's even more hazardous than the Olympics, because if you fumble on the first date, you don't get a chance to compete again next year. Olympic skaters study for years to achieve their dream. But when performing, their moves appear instinctive and seemingly effortless. That's how you should appear as you build your relationship, casual and relaxed. I'll give you the scientifically proven right dating moves to win the game of love. Study them. But when you are with your quarry, let them become second nature so you can perform with star-quality smoothness. Gentlemen often ask me, how soon should I make my move to ask her for a date? It's like in the theater. Whenever one of my actress friends tells me she got the part, I can always tell from the degree of delight in her voice how she got it. In the theater, there is a custom called typecasting. It means getting cast in a movie or a play just because you look the part. You sit in a big room and the producer or director just points to several people who look right. You, you, and you, you're cast. 
The traditional and more difficult procedure for getting a role, however, is going to an audition. If the producers like you, they invite you to what is called a callback for a second audition. For big shows, there can be a third or even fourth callback before getting hired. Actors and actresses like to feel that directors cast them because of their theatrical talent, not just because they looked the part. When it comes to love, people feel the same way, especially women. Question. How soon after meeting your quarry should you pop the question, will you go out with me? Answer. Not until they feel they have earned your interest. Gentlemen, that's why it's so important to ask the woman questions about herself before asking her out. She wants to feel that you are asking her out because you appreciate her personality, her sensitivity, her intelligence, her sense of humor, her persona, not just her looks. So let the attractive woman tell you of her extraordinary business acumen before you suggest lunch to talk about collaboration, i.e. asking her for a date. Ladies, let him tell you how much dead wood he slashed while hacking and slashing his way through the corporate jungle before you invite him to lunch to meet your uncle who might hire him, i.e. finagle a date. Let your quarry feel they earned your interest or attentions through their brilliance, their fascinating nature, their talents, their wonderful uniqueness. Then they'll value your company all the more because they got it the old-fashioned way. They earned it. Let your new acquaintance pass the audition before you offer them the role of romantic lead for the evening. Technique number nine, more important for hunters. Let her pass the audition first. Hunters, don't ask a woman out too soon, lest she think it's only because of her looks. A woman values your interest all the more if she feels you appreciate her other qualities. Huntresses, you can be a bit faster. Men are less accustomed to being sex objects. In fact, some might enjoy it. Gentlemen, there is another reason you should not ask her out immediately. Before she invests an evening of her valuable time in you, she wants to know she's going to enjoy it. A woman needs more input. So talk more. Reveal yourself. Give her more information so she can make an educated judgment about you before she has to say yes or no. Now I ask an age-old question. Should I or shouldn't I play hard to get? Let's go to the studies. Four highly respected social scientists Pioneers in the field of love were firmly convinced, as were their colleagues in the general public, that men liked a hard-to-get woman better. After all, everybody values that which they have to work for, right? However, not to leave any stone unturned, they conducted an in-depth study called, quote, Playing Hard to Get, Understanding an Elusive Phenomenon. Researchers hired a group of young men and women who had signed up for a computer dating program. The men were to call the women and ask them for a date. The researchers told the women that, half the time, they should pause and think for three seconds before accepting the date, thus playing hard to get. The other half of the time, the women should accept the date immediately with enthusiasm, thus being easy to get. Afterward, researchers asked the men how they felt about the women. The results astounded them. In spite of what the men had said in the hypothetical situation, in reality, they did not like the hard-to-get women any better. So much for that theory. The researchers tested and retested the hypothesis in five ways, and all five failed. Just as science destroyed the prevailing theory that the world is flat and that heavier stones fall faster than smaller ones, science has now destroyed yet another myth. Playing hard-to-get with a man does not make him want you more. At least, not at first. There was a wrinkle as further experimentation showed. In another part of the study, men had the opportunity to choose from among five women for a date, thinking that other men were competing for the company of one of them. That worked. When the woman was hard to get for his rivals, but easy to get for him, he liked her more, a lot more. Technique number 10. I'm hard to get. But for you, baby. Considering playing hard to get? Don't, with him. When he asks you for a date, respond immediately and energetically with, Oh, I'd love to. Better yet, when he says, Would you like to go to the movies or whatever? Respond by saying, 
I'd love to go out with you. Let us now explore the scientifically proven best first date. Many a hunter, having beguiled his new quarry into a first date, now wonders, where should I take her? Many a huntress, when asked where she would like to go, simply says, oh, let's go to dinner. Well, yes, that's always been my choice. Over dinner, you can get to know your potential love partner. It gives him the opportunity to explore all the wondrous facets of your scintillating personality. But if your goal is, as the fact that you're listening to this tape attests, to get your quarry to fall in love with you, that is not the best choice. There is compelling evidence showing they will be more attracted to you if you place them in an emotionally stirring or vulnerable situation. Let me explain. Researchers have proved that there is a strong link between emotional arousal and sexual attraction. In an experiment, they took female research assistants and male subjects to a scenic spot. The locale was a popular tourist attraction where the subjects could peek way down into a frighteningly deep cavernous gorge. Only two bridges crossed the gorge. One was the choice of tourists, a safe and solid wooden bridge. And then there was the other one. The other one was terrifying. It swayed side to side, it blew in the wind, and it tipped precariously over the gorge. Only a few brave feet ever trod across that bridge. In the study, male subjects were assigned to walk across either one bridge or the other. Whichever bridge they traversed, all males were met on the other side by a female research assistant. After crossing the bridge, either the solid one or the tippy precarious one, a female research assistant showed each subject a picture. He was told to write a brief story about it. Then the female research assistant thanked him and gave the subject her home phone number. She casually remarked that if he would like to, quote, further discuss the experience, he could call her at home. What was that experiment all about? The researchers were looking to see which stories had more sexual imagery and which men took the female research assistants up on their invitation to call them at home. Results. The men who had walked across the scary bridge wrote the sexiest stories, and the men who crossed the scary bridge, you guessed it, were more apt to call the females at home to, quote, discuss the traumatic experience. The experiment showed that anxiety-producing situations create a more erotic turn-on. Why? It all goes back to the drug we discussed earlier, phenylethylamine or P. Fear produces the same substance which shoots through our veins in the early stages of infatuation. Now, obviously it is not possible nor practical to suggest an outing where you make your date cross a scary bridge. But science tells us if your first experience together is stirring, your date will transfer the strong emotions to you. Hunters, you could take her horseback riding or surfing. If these physical activities are too strenuous, choose an emotionally exhausting experience, a moving play, a scary movie, or a great concert. For example, a beautiful ballet leaves me emotionally exhausted. Perhaps your quarry is moved by music. Maybe she loves opera. Maybe he's into watching dog fights. Sharing anxiety and talking about a stressful situation brings couples together. Many office romances start as the two face the same challenges. And movies and plays and fairy tales are crawling with heroes and heroines, defeating the big bad wolf together, then living happily ever after. File 6 Audiobookforfree.com provides advertisers with a mechanism to put their adverts to the relevant listener according to the listener's hobbies and lifestyle. Adverts heard with our books will be of more interest and relevance to the individual listener than traditional radio adverts. Technique number 11. Give first date butterflies. When planning your first date, find out what really pulls your quarry strings. Then plan an arousing emotional experience. You don't have to risk life and limb together, but a little early co-anxiety is a proven aphrodisiac. And then, of course, it's nice to have dinner afterward so you can, quote, discuss the traumatic experience. No matter what activity you choose for your first date, it's probably going to involve dinner, before, after, or as the main event. Many men dread the grueling chore of having to choose a restaurant, 
Should he impress you and depress his wallet, or take you to his favorite hamburger joint? Make it easy for him, and show him you're not a gold digger at the same time. If he asks you for suggestions, come up with this, quote, great little place you think he might enjoy. Read Charming But Cheap. Technique number 12 for Huntresses, called I Know a Great Little Place. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach and his wallet. In every woman's little black book should be the name of a fabulous, charming, and inexpensive restaurant. Men, you too can choose a charming and inexpensive bistro, although beware that a first-class dinner at an expensive restaurant is an aphrodisiac for many women. There is a strong argument for taking a lady to an upscale restaurant on the first date, and not just to impress her with your gold credit card. You will come off better in a plush setting. Here's proof. Researchers showed pictures of men and women in various settings to subjects. The subjects judged the same men and women to be more attractive when they were shown seated in a pleasant room with beautiful paintings and draperies, thus showing that people transfer their feelings about the ambience to whomever they are with. Technique number 13 for hunters. Bring for a nice restaurant. If you're dining out on your first date, take her to a restaurant with an atmosphere like the one you want to project. Elegant, upbeat, cool, arty. Atmosphere is important because she will transfer her feelings about the atmosphere to you. Gentlemen, there's also an argument for taking the lady to a plush party rather than a crowded bash. The title of a study called Hot and Crowded, Influence of Population Density and Temperature on Interpersonal Affective Behavior says it all. Now, let's talk about your first date duds. Do clothes make the man? Do clothes make the woman? Of course not, but they dramatically influence a potential love partner's perception of you. And remember, their perception is all they have to go on when you first meet. When I first researched the ideal love-hunting outfit, I thought, as perhaps you do now, that clothes are more important on the women. Not so. Men's instinctive ability to mentally undress a woman makes a girl wonder if it was worth spending that last month's paycheck on that great Versace ensemble. How curious it is that a woman will ruminate for hours on what to wear on a date, whereas a man grabs the first threads his groping hand hits in the darkened closet. And unless the studies lie, it should be the exact opposite. Men's hunting gear is far more important to make the kill than a woman's. Let's once again turn to science to get the bottom line on clothes. In a University of Syracuse study, both men and women were shown pictures of opposite-sex individuals. Some of the men and women in the photos wore chic, upscale clothes, and the others wore less expensive outfits that ranged from cheap to downright cheesy. The results? Hunters first. The women were asked six hypothetical questions all the way from who would you choose to marry to a rather surprising scientific probing, who would you choose for a one-night stand? How the male was dressed was extremely more important to the women. Many women have an uncanny ability to spot a pair of Gucci shoes on a man a quarter of a mile away across a crowded ballroom. Evolutionary theorists tell us that a woman subconsciously listens to her genes. When a man is well-dressed, it signifies his ability to provide for her eventual offspring. So even when she's saying, should I or shouldn't I tonight, how well you could care for her unborn children is in the back of her mind. Don't blame the woman. She's just instinctively doing what another nature decrees. Now, huntresses, how you were dressed really didn't matter. The male is going to mentally undress you anyway. So, ladies, concentrate more on your makeup, your healthy-looking hair, your posture, your look of confidence and health. Hunters, huntresses, we have now gotten our feet wet by immersing them in the all-important firsts. First glance, first approach, first moves, first conversation, and first date, even what clothes to wear. Let us now proceed into deeper more subliminal waters. We're going to explore lovers' needs for similar yet complementary qualities. Before we start our journey, however, I ask only one thing of you. 
Please suspend any preconceived notions of what you should and should not do in a relationship. Listen to what science tells us about our cunning ambition to get someone to fall in love with you. For that, we need some extremely subtle techniques. Techniques which follow. Crucial element number two to make your quarry fall in love with you. Giving the sense of having similar character, yet fulfilling their complementary needs. You've heard the old chestnut, opposites attract, and Mom and Dad undoubtedly told you birds of a feather flock together. Sound like contradictions, don't they? But in the magically insane yet scientifically rational universe of romantic love, they're not. Here's why. All the studies tell us lovers are drawn to partners with similar attitudes, values, interests, and outlooks on life. In our fast-paced world of so many stimuli bombarding us every minute, our heads are spinning. We are constantly asking ourselves, how should I feel about that? What should I believe? With the grains of so many truths and so many lies whirling round our brains, we wonder, what really makes sense? Finally, when we find someone who has come to the same conclusions about the world, we feel a tremendous sense of relief. We feel close to them. Love romanticizes that into, it's you and me, baby, alone against this mad, mad world. Similarity is safe. Yet too much similarity over time becomes boring. So people seek differences. But here's the rub. They only seek certain kinds of differences. Lovers want qualities that are just different enough to keep the relationship interesting, but not interfere with their own lifestyle. They choose partners who can give them new experiences, expose them to new ideas, teach them new skills, improve their lifestyle, make up for their lacks. These are called complementary qualities. The definition of complementary is something that, quote, completes or brings to perfection. For instance, a bashful man might be drawn to a gabby mate to make up for his own shyness. A woman lacking in worldly sophistication might be impressed with a man who knows his wines. So you see... Lovers are not looking for something vastly different in a partner, just different enough to fit in with their lives and bring them, as a couple, to perfection. To make someone fall in love with you, that's your assignment. The following similarities, or lack of them, will show up at various stages of your relationship. Number one is conspicuous, unmistakable, and easy to create. Number two becomes evident to your quarry gradually, usually over the span of the first few dates. Number three is subtle, elusive, and it can take years to unfold, often after it's too late. It's also the one that is most insidious and gives couples the biggest problems in the long run. This final similarity is deeply buried, often carefully camouflaged, and seldom voluntarily revealed. To excavate it, you must sharpen your pickaxe and dig way down. Let us explore each type of similarity. Then I will give you techniques to make your new PLP sense that you are soulmates in all three. Similarity number one is what interests the two of you have. What kind of hobbies, sports, and activities do you both enjoy? What kind of music do you both like? What films do you enjoy? What books do you read? Huntresses, beware. This one's more important than you think. Let's look at a trite but true fact. Women deepen relationships by talking together. Men bond by doing things together. A woman longs for a man who understands her, who she can talk to. She likes to feel that when the going gets tough, there will be a big shoulder to cry on, a strong arm to comfort her, and, above all, a sympathetic ear to listen to her. Good verbal communication is important to a man, too, but it's higher on the female wish list. Now, a man wants a woman who enjoys the same activities. One he can have fun with. He likes to feel they can play tennis, go to concerts, basketball games, movies, or just sit home and be side-by-side -side couch potatoes. Doing things is important to a woman, too, but it's higher on the male wish list. Fortunately for huntresses, it's easy to show a man this first kind of similarity. You can make him think you enjoy his interests very early in a relationship, often in the first conversation. I have a buddy named Phil. Well, my friend Phil told me about a woman he recently met at a party. He liked her. 
she seemed to like him. As a prelude to inviting her to break away from the party and go to a jazz club with him, he alluded to his deep interest in jazz. Oh, I used to go to jazz clubs. Well, so much for that one. Then Phil mentioned that the classic film Casablanca was playing at the local art cinema. Oh, yeah, I saw it. That was the end of that. This woman may have known a lot about jazz and old movies, but she had a thing or two to learn about men. Don't cut them off at the pass. In fact, Huntresses, when you learn what interests him, hint that that's your passion, too. Many men ask a woman out just because she enjoys the same activities he does. I have another buddy named Derek, a very good-looking man who lives in Orlando, Florida. Poor Derek is at wit's ends because he loves to jet ski every weekend. He also adores women. And because his free time is limited, he must make a choice. You can bet the first lady who crosses her fingers behind her back and says, Oh, jet skiing, I've always wanted to try that. We'll have a date with Derek and a head start on capturing his heart. If your quarry likes stamp collecting, kite flying, or going to sambo wrestling matches, tell him of your fervor for stamps, kites, or sambo wrestlers. Many men have a passion for an activity and a passion for women, but few can blend them. File 8. Audiobookforfree.com has a special section designed to be used by blind and visually impaired listeners. Enjoy the colorful world of our audiobooks. Crucial element number three to make your quarry fall in love with you. Feed their ego in a very special way. Now let us come to yet another crucial element in making people fall in love with you. Feeding their ego. How good you make them feel about themselves when they're with you. There is one conviction every man and every woman in the Western world shares, and that is the certitude. I am different. I am unique. I am special. No matter how ordinary I may appear to the outside world, Inside, I know I am a singular sensation. Somehow we were all born feeling that way. As infants, we thought we had Mummy and Daddy's unconditional love. But then, for most of us, the realities and insecurities of life set in. Many people spend the rest of their lives desperately searching for that someone who will help them recapture the childhood dream of unconditional love. They convince themselves, someday, somewhere, someone will come along and this individual will recognize my specialness over all other ordinary individuals, and they will love me for being me. Not for my physical beauty, not for my money, but for me, the essence of me. Make your quarry feel you are that person, and your reward is they will fall in love with you, because the pools where people behold the most ideal reflections of themselves are the eyes of the men and the women they fall in love with. Let us now proceed to the secret of making your quarry feel that he or she has, at long last, found the person with the potential to love them unconditionally. I have many techniques to feed your quarry's image, but I want to share with you here the most important one of all. I call it the Big Bombshell Booster. The hottest way to fan the flames of love and keep them burning forever is to feed your quarry's deepest self-image. It starts with the two of you playing a game, but only you know the rules. In a quiet moment, conducive to conversation, say, You know, honey, I was listening to this tape the other day, and it talked about how, when all is said and done, when life comes to a close, what would you want to be remembered for? People were asking each other what they wanted inscribed upon their tombstones. Well, not everyone has the same self-image. Not everyone wants to feel brilliant or beautiful, there are those who would prefer to be perceived as Mr. Clean, a playboy, a Lolita, a sweet little princess, or a crazy, wonderful kind of crackpot genius. The variety of self-images is incalculable. And the secret is not to blatantly compliment, but to support your quarry's image. Quote, 
Rest in peace. Here lies Sally Smith. She was an adventurous soul. Or, here lies Sally Smith. She was a giving and caring individual. Or perhaps, rest in peace. John Jones. He was a wise and insightful man. Or, here lies John Jones. He made the world a better place. Ask your quarry to play that game. Give them your self-image first, and then ask theirs. Now, here's the technique. Don't mention it for several weeks. But then, when the time comes for you to tell your quarry how much you admire them or why you love them, say, Sally, I love you because you're so adventurous. Or, Sally, I love you because you are such a caring and giving individual. Or, huntresses, say, John, I love you because you're so wise and insightful. Or, John, I love you because you make the world a better place. Wow, that really gets them in their deepest spot. Technique number 19, the big bombshell booster. First play the what would you like inscribed on your tombstone game. Remember their answer. Then weeks later, tell your quarry that's why you love or admire them. It's a big bombshell that boosts their self-image. It is saying, I love you for the essence of you, not for what you can do for me, but because you are you, and that's how we all want to be loved. We fall in love and stay in love with those in whose eyes we see our own ideal self-image. There you have it. The best ego meal to feed your quarry's ego, and then get them addicted to the delicious ego cuisine that you concoct. Crucial element number four to make your quarry fall in love with you. The equity principle. Showing him or her that you bring equal or better objective value to the relationship. During a heated argument, a man I once loved snarled at me. Everybody's got a value in the open market, baby. I was appalled. How crass. How could he see people as commodities? Especially somebody he said he loved. What a repulsive way to look at relationships. To me, love was beautiful. Love was pure. It was the source of the most intense human pleasure known to mankind and had no parallel in human experience. To me, love was sharing, trusting, total giving of self. The words of Robert Burns had reverberated in my heart since childhood. Love, oh, lyric love, half angel and half a bird, and all a wonder and a wild desire. And then to hear him liken his loved one's qualities to pork bellies or soybeans on the commodities market. That was too much. I stormed out of the room, and soon thereafter out of the relationship. Now, many years later, older, and some few could argue wiser, I wonder, was he right? Not in his manner of presentation, certainly, but in his facts. It surprises no one to hear that everyone wants to get the best possible deal in life. Nor are they shocked when they learn about the law of supply and demand in business. People don't even flinch when sales gurus preach that in all human interaction, the big question is, WIFM, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? So why do we recoil when researchers tell us the same natural laws apply to love? Recently, the scientific community, not content with theories of love proposed by Sigmund Freud, sublimated sexuality, or Theodore Reich, filling a void in oneself, set out to get the real skinny on love. Conducting numerous surveys and laboratory experiments, they peeled back a deeper layer of the human psyche. Did they uncover some ugly facts? Did they confront a monster? Some might say yes. Others would laugh it off and say, of course not. Whether you see their findings as the abominable snowman or the archangel of truth, it is quite simply this. Studies do indeed support the thesis that everything and everybody has a quantifiable value on the open market, and everybody wants to get the best deal in love as well as in life. Researchers christened their findings the equity or exchange theory of love. The equity theory of love is based on the same sound principles of barter and open market value. Lovers unconsciously calculate the other person's comparable worth, the cost-benefit ratio of the relationship, the hidden costs, the maintenance fee, the assumed appreciation. 
Then they ask themselves, Is this the best offer I can get? Everybody has a big scorecard locked away in their heart. And in order to make somebody fall in love with you, you have to make them feel that they are getting a very good deal. In love, the studies show that the more qualities you bring to the bargaining table, the, quote, better you will do in love. The more your assets even out, the more apt you are to make someone fall in love with you. Equity theorists tell us, quote, The more equitable a romantic relationship is, the more likely it is to progress to marriage. Let's put it in monetary terms. What currency buys a good partner? Proponents of the equity principle list six elements which are assets on the open market when lovers go husband or wife shopping. Number one, physical appearance. Number two, possessions or money. Number three, status or prestige. Number four, information or knowledge. Five, social graces or personality. And six, inner nature. Researchers tell us that in the happiest of relationships, the partners are more or less equal in each of the above categories, or if not, their qualities balance each other out across the board. But usually, partners who wind up together are relatively equal in the same category. As an example, let's take category number one, physical appearance. Studies all the world over, the United States, Canada, Germany, Japan, show that men and women usually wind up marrying people who are just about as attractive as they are. A group of psychologists observed young couples at social events and rated their appearance on a scale similar to the now legendary Bo Derrick's 1 to 10 rating. They found that 60% were separated by only one point on the scale and 85% by two points or less. I decided to put their findings to my own informal test. For several weeks, everywhere I went, to the movies, to the mall, to parties, to restaurants, I watched husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends. I looked first at the man, then at his partner. Individually, on a scale of one to ten, I rated their appearance. And never were they more than two points apart. Try it. It's an awful game, but it proves the point. Researchers tell us if a couple is not equal in the same category, usually they're, quote, assets, across the list even out. For example... How often walking down the street have you passed a stunning woman on the arm of a pinch-faced, much older man? What is your first thought? Admit it. You probably said to yourself, gosh, he must really be rich. Or you see a handsome man walking with his arm around a very plain woman. You muse, golly, she must have a great personality. That's the equity or horse trading principle at work. It can't be denied. Good looks, lots of money, and high social status are definitely legal tender in the acquisition of love. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. We all think we want a terrific partner higher in all the categories than us, richer, kinder, better looking. Practically every young American girl of my generation tucked the covers daintily around herself every night, dreaming of the handsome prince who was someday going to come riding by on his white horse. He would, of course, fall madly in love with us, scoop us up, and we would live happily ever after. Oh, it didn't always have to be the, the handsome prince. It could be a rich prince, a wonderfully kind prince, or a strong and sensitive prince. Perhaps we dreamed he would be a poet, or an artist, or maybe a famous actor prince. As we grew older, our dream didn't change. We simply expanded the definition of prince. He could be an internationally esteemed doctor prince, a brilliant CEO prince, a Silicon Valley sage prince, or a state governor prince. But whatever role we cast him in, he was the prince. Huntresses, maybe even now you still believe, someday my prince will come. Well, guess what? He may come. But when you see the results of the studies on love, you will realize you don't want him to come. Women, if it's happiness you seek, you don't want to marry the handsome prince. Men, you don't want to marry the beautiful princess. Sour grapes? Not at all. Unless you were born in a royal crib, unless you are equally beautiful, equally rich, equally accomplished, life with prince or princess would be inequitable, and therefore you would be miserable. No, you protest. If I married someone better looking, richer, more accomplished, for simplicity, let's just say better, if I married someone better than me, I'd be thrilled. Yes, the studies tell us, but not for long. 
the equity theory proves you'd soon be unhappy. The more, quote, superior your partner is to you, the quicker you'd both feel wretched. The principle states that when there is an imbalance in a relationship, both partners sense the inequity and try to restore the balance. In other words, even the score. It is easy to understand why, in an inequitable relationship, the superior partner might feel dissatisfied. After the first blush of love wears off, he or she looks around and figures, they deserve a much better deal. But what about the inferior partner? Shouldn't he or she feel darn lucky to have bagged such a great mate? Supposedly, yes. But in reality, they wind up worried, insecure, always afraid they don't measure up. Then insidious things start happening, and the inequality monster starts eating away the love. In inequitable marriages, the partners start taking advantage of the relationship to even the score. The superior partner might start to make subtle demands, like feeling entitled to conversation whenever he or she feels like it, or solitude whenever the mood strikes. A superior wife might get lazy with verbal expressions of love and affection or withhold sex. If she is already giving more than her husband, she figures subconsciously, why work harder to make his sex life fulfilling? A superior husband might even feel justified embarking on an extramarital affair. After all, he tells himself, I deserve more. The poor inferior in the relationship is doomed to a life of insecurity about their love or having to swallow it whenever the partner decides to take advantage of the relationship. The happiness at having bagged such a great mate soon turns into the day-to-day -day reality of always being number two. It's no fun being number two and spending your life trying harder. If you're a poor plain Jane and you marry the rich, handsome prince, he might wind up berating you, or you might go crazy on a self-improvement kick. If you didn't measure up, you'd be crushed. You could turn to drink or drugs or an eating disorder. Princess Di and Charles have certainly done their bit to destroy the joy of marrying the prince myth. Let's say you're an American princess with lots of money and good looks. You fall in love with a handsome, sensitive plumber who comes to fix the pipes on Daddy's yacht. Because you believe in true love, you marry him. Now, obviously, you call the shots in the relationship, like where to vacation and what kind of car to buy. At first, you both consider it fair because... After all, Daddy's money is paying for it. But Sensitive Plumber has pride. As time goes by, his ego can't take it. And even though he felt darn lucky when he married you, it ends up in bitter divorce. You really didn't do anything wrong. He didn't either. He's a nice guy. You played fair. It's just that the inequity overwhelmed the two of you. He winds up much happier with the waitress from the coffee shop. So far in this section... We've talked about market value through 1. Physical appearance, 2. Possessions or money, 3. Status or prestige. These are but the first three assets that the equity principle scientists say influence love. They are important, but by no means the most important. In fact, many people prefer the next three qualities by far. They are 4. Information or knowledge. 5. Social graces or personality. 6. Inner nature, inner beauty, these are tangible assets. Let's talk about that number four, knowledge. The pursuit of knowledge is a lifetime commitment, one that brings you deep joy throughout your life. Intelligence gained through knowledge is also a potent asset in making someone fall in love with you. Many women, myself included, find the seedy, professorial, pipe-smoking, suede patches on the elbows of his sweater type of man very attractive. I once flipped over a man whom other women might call a poor, homely recluse because he was a genius on the computer. His knowledge deeply impressed me, and I wanted to learn from him. Hunters, especially in today's world, women have a tendency to fall in love with men who can help them professionally. Your knowledge is an aphrodisiac to bright, ambitious women. Social graces or personality is the fifth asset which gives you a higher value on the open love market. Techniques throughout this tape deal with these two aspects. Heed them all. The final asset on the list, and by no means the least, is your inner nature. Perhaps this is the most important of all. It certainly is the deepest. To make someone fall in love with you, strive always to have loving thoughts about them and about others. Give selflessly to other persons when there is no reward in sight. Be sexually faithful, financially responsible, and personally flexible. The list of inner nature qualities goes on and on. You probably never thought of them in these terms.
but they are all marketable assets you bring to a relationship. Everything you learn, every experience you possess, every fine quality you develop is a tangible benefit in making someone fall in love with you. File 9 in audiobookforfree.com, each audio clip is linked to additional text with more information about this advertised product or service. The listener can find this additional information by clicking on the book in which he has heard this advert. There he can also find the telephone number, email and website address of the company selling this product or service. Technique number 20. Up your ante in intangibles. To up your market value, never stop learning. Never stop developing your personality and social skills. And always strive to develop fine inner qualities. They are as good as golden bullets to pierce your quarry's heart. So where, you might well ask, does the purity, the beauty, and the selfless kind of love come in? What about couples who pledge eternal love till death do us part and mean it? Yes, of course we can achieve that beautiful love. In time. Actually, the lyric love of Robert Burns and the fundamentally practical egocentric discoveries about love are not incompatible. Many couples stay together, stay happy, and stay in love for a lifetime. But if you look above their heads, you'll see a giant scorecard in the sky. There is probably a balance in what each brings to the relationship. Often there are subjective values that outsiders can't see. At any isolated point in time, the relationship can appear inequitable to strangers, because when partners commit to a lifetime relationship, it's no longer tit-for-tat on a daily, weekly, or even monthly basis. The scorecard can become unequal for a while. For instance, the wife may support the husband while he goes through medical school. She's in the superior position for a few years. He's getting the better deal. But then, when he has his degree, he is expected to either finance her education or support the family in style to even the score. Once two people who love each other have made a commitment, the boat can stay afloat tilting in one direction for a while, but it must rock back the other way before they reach the ultimate balance and they can hope for a smooth journey. People can accept favors from their partner, but the truly wise ones pay back to keep the balance of assets in the relationship on a par. You might ask, what about relationships that seem very one-sided for a long time? For instance, a loving husband or wife who selflessly cares for their ailing partner in their later years. Well, years spent together actually becomes one of the assets brought to the relationship. They don't think of it in those terms, but the caregiving partner is paying back their beloved for the years of happiness they've received in the relationship. I have some lovely friends, an elderly couple in their 70s, Jack and Elizabeth. Poor Elizabeth has been suffering from Alzheimer's disease for some years now. Jack still gives dinner parties, and he always seats Elizabeth right next to him. He holds her hand, he kisses her cheek occasionally, and he refers to her as my bride. Why, when the relationship seems so one-sided, is Jack still so much in love? Because the years of joy that Elizabeth gave Jack during their life together have become a tangible value that Elizabeth brings to the relationship. Why have I spent this time exploring this horse-trading principle of love? because it is upon this rock-solid foundation, equity, that we build many of the techniques to make someone fall in love with you. Crucial element number five to make your quarry fall in love with you. Avoiding gender-specific first date bloopers. Now we're going to talk about some very gender-specific ways men and women screw up what could potentially be a beautiful relationship. Why do they screw it up? Well, just because men are men and women are women. And that's just the beginning of the differences. Did you see the 1977 movie Annie Hall? When Diane Keaton is out with Woody Allen for the first time, a little bubble comes out of her head saying, Oh, I hope he's not a jerk like all the others. During the first moments of meeting you, your quarry is hoping the same about you. Early love is a delicate little flower. Its tiny petals are often crushed by one of the partners unknowingly committing a small blooper on the first date, which turns the other off. 
gentleman, a stupid joke, a, a slurping of the coke, an unintended insult, can abort takeoff and leave a new relationship burning on the side of the runway. Ladies, something silly like turning your head when he tries to kiss you before entering the party because you don't want to smear your lipstick, it can bruise his ego and make him run to the next potential lover. Later in the love affair, the same blooper amounts to no more than a slightly uncomfortable air pocket. There are many techniques in how to make anyone fall in love with you, but for the sake of time, let us explore now one of the most obvious. There was a time when a woman was expected to have no aspirations outside the home and only be interested in, quote, woman talk. Men felt self-righteous leaving the women to pratter as they retired into the den to deliberate on really important issues, like which cigar had the best flavor. But times have changed. What used to be a resigned, well, boys will be boys, or isn't that just like a woman, is now grounds for your quarry departing for greener pastures. Today, huntresses demand a sensitive man who will share her feelings, and hunters envision superwoman who gives him great company, great kids, great compassion, and great orgasms. Does this new breed of sensitive man and superwoman exist? The question is academic, because it's not reality. It's your quarry's perceptions we're dealing with. Relationship-shy quarry often run at the first sign of stereotypical gender behavior. Let's talk about the conversational gender gap. We spot this one very early. It is evident in nursery schools and kindergartens all across America. In the middle of the room, little boys are bashing other little boys. Meanwhile, around the nursery, little girls are sharing toys and holding deep communion with other little girls. Unfortunately, the same gap splits many middle-class parties of marriage right down the middle. The men stand center stage, arguing sports or politics. And the women, seated around the room, are supportively chatting with each other. Why the division? It's simply because men enjoy talking about certain subjects and women fancy others. Yes, decades of denial aside, men and women do enjoy discussing different subjects. All gender comments are generalizations, to be sure, but usually women are more people-centered and men are more thing-centered. Men enjoy talking about cars, gadgets, tools, about how things are made, how they work, how they can fix them, what their effect is, and how they control them. More intellectual men expand things, to include ideas and concepts. But they still discuss how these concepts work, how they can fix them, how they affect the world, and how much power they have over them. Huntresses, brushing up on sports, politics, cars, and computers increases your chances of communicating well with men. And if you learn how to hold your own with a man bantering about saber saws and power drills, you will be a fascinating lady indeed. When I was in high school, the literature on gender differences was limited to obscure studies. But my mother somehow intuitively knew about the cavernous conversational gap. The boys talked about cars, and the girls talked about boys. That left us girls at a conversational disadvantage on our dates. After one disastrously silent evening with a boy, we called them boys in those days, not guys, I cried in my mother's lap. I told her I couldn't think of anything to talk about, and I had been frozen with shyness. My mother stroked my hair, she dried my tears, and she told me she'd have a surprise for me the next day that would help. I believed in Mama and expected a miracle, even if she had to fly a chunk of the Blarney Stone in from Ireland so that I could kiss it and get the gift of gab. Mama would pull through for me. And pull through she did. Better than the Blarney Stone, she bought me a book on cars, all the current models. I became something of an expert on the difference between Chevys and Fords and Buicks. I could even discuss what goes on under the hood. It got so I could keep up my end of the conversation when the subject turned, as it inevitably did, to carburetors, alternators, camshafts, and exhaust manifolds. Mama's book got my self-confidence with boys humming. Huntresses, you may not find discussing cars, facts, sports, business, and politics as interesting as psychology, philosophy, relationship, reactions, and trends. But your quarry will find you a more intriguing woman if you can hold your own pitching phenomena and numbers around with him. A man in one of my seminars told me that the reason he asked his current girlfriend out was because, when they met, they had a, quote, engrossing discussion of whether slip, joint, or round nose pliers was better to have in a basic toolkit. He added, of course, that he won the argument. Hunters, you want to be smart in male subjects, but not smarter than him. Does this sound like outdated 50s retro-pap advice? 
Of course it does, but it still holds. I learned this the hard way a long time ago. On the evening of my high school prom, my date arrived on my doorstep. He pinned the corsage on my padded bust. I took his arm, and we walked to his car. It wouldn't start. But thanks to Mama's book, I suspected the problem. I looked under his hood and made a silent analysis. I then ran out into the street and flagged down a taxi, not to take us to the dance, but to borrow the driver's jumper cables. Tottering in my first pair of high heels, I attached the jumper cables to his dead battery and got his engine purring. I knew my date would be impressed. He never called again. I recently told this story to a male friend, and in a truly candid moment, he empathized with my, quote, poor, humiliated date. Eventual equality aside, some things will never change. File 10. Audiobookforfree.com has a special section designed to be used by blind and visually impaired listeners. Enjoy the colorful world of our audiobooks. Technique number 21. Brush up on man talk. Take a conversational cruise across the gender gap. Huntresses become conversant in concepts, politics, objects, Big toys, sports, and other male subjects. Show him you're smart, but remember, not too smart. Hunters, a similar suggestion for you. Generally, women have excellent insights into people, their problems, and their responses to various situations. They talk about health, the arts, personal growth, and sometimes spiritual subjects. When discussing work, women are less competitive. They are more apt to explore how individuals work together and what constitutes a smooth and supportive work environment, not who's on top and who's on bottom. Learn to thoughtfully probe feelings. A suggestion, gentlemen. Pick up a copy of Psychology Today, a magazine with a readership of intelligent women. It is an excellent way to brush up on what subjects are hot for women. Technique number 22 for hunters. Brush up on woman talk. Hunters, make your conversation more psychologically oriented. Converse with your quarry in terms of people, feelings, philosophy, rationale, and intuition. And be more supportive, less competitive in your insights. These are generalizations, to be sure. There is always the man who enjoys discussing the deeper aspects of human relationships and the woman who enjoys a tough political argument. You'll spot these rare birds, but they'll be hard to catch, because the insightful man will be in the company of beautiful women, and the clever woman will already be dating some heavy hitters. And now we come to the section we've all been waiting for, sex. We'll talk about stroking, massaging, and penetrating a man's and woman's hottest erogenous zone. You'll learn all about the creases and the folds of the human body's most erotic organ. What bodily part are we talking about? The brain, your quarry's most erogenous zone of all. When you've mastered manipulation of that organ, you'll have the magic key to make him or her fall in love with you. Crucial element number six to make your quarry fall in love with you. Fulfilling their deepest sexual fantasies. Every month, magazines print sweeping generalizations about what every man wants or what every woman responds to sexually. But not all women crave their man weaving a rose into her pubic hair. Not all men thrill to finding his woman naked and wrapped in saran wrap hiding behind his bedroom door. Our sexuality is as individual as our thumbprint. General advice on how to be a good lover might work for the proverbial every man or every woman, but you are not every man or every woman. Your quarry is not every man or every woman. You are in bed with one unique individual, and to make that person fall sexually in love with you, 
you must throw back the sheets and uncover their very special needs. Some like it tough, some like it tender, some like it raucous, some like it refined, some like it crude, some like it considerate. The variety of desires that falls within the range of absolute, utter, consummate, normal is astounding. When I was working with a project, the organization I created for the purpose of collecting data on people's sexual desires, I found only one common thread to both men and women. Everyone liked a partner who was passionate for them. And practically all men wanted a woman who wants to continue to explore her sexuality with him, a woman who is open-minded enough to play. I interviewed a man at the project who had recently started dating his girlfriend, Tanya. He said their lovemaking was exciting, and Tanya seemed open to whatever John did. He was beginning to have serious feelings, he said, i.e. love, for her. One Sunday they were taking a country drive on a long, lonely road, which wound through an enticingly private-looking woods. John started to feel those familiar rumblings. He turned to Tanya and said, Hey, um, what would you say to a quickie over there in the woods? John said Tanya looked at him as though he were crazy. Then that night at her house, as they were about to get into bed, John had another adventurous erotic suggestion. He examined her sturdy dresser, which was just about the right height. Full of hope, he said, Honey, why don't you sit up on the dresser and we'll do it there? Again, Tanya frowned and looked at John as though he had gone bonkers. Actually, John said, she went along with it, and they made love with him standing and her sitting on the dresser. But her initial reaction made him feel dirty and guilty for having suggested it. He never again proposed any other unusual position or place for sex. John said that, as much as he liked Tanya, that was the beginning of the end of their relationship. Most men want their woman to be playful and enjoy sex. If you have serious intentions of capturing your quarry's heart, let your rational emotions go and play more, have more fun in bed. Think back to when you were a little girl, rolling around in the sandbox with the other kids, giggling, wiggling, talking, laughing, and building sandcastles. You used your imagination to have fun. Little girls in the euphoria of the moment throwing sand in the air and shouting, we aren't having an inner dialogue with themselves. They aren't asking themselves, does my playmate really like me? Is he just using me to build sandcastles? Should I fake that I'm having more fun? Is he expressing enough affection? Why doesn't he shout we, too? Isn't he enjoying it? Uh-oh, will he play in the sandbox with me when we get back to the city? Children lost in a wonderland of sensual pleasure let their imaginations run wild. They can turn their concerns off and their fantasies on. Well, bed is the adult sandbox, the place to, to giggle, wiggle, talk, and build fantasy castles. It's the place to let your imagination run wild. Bed is the place to turn your concerns off and your fantasies on. Technique number 23 for Huntresses. Be a sexual adventurous with him. If he hints at a sexual activity he wants, unless it really turns you off and you would feel badly about yourself playing with it, do it. Most men want a woman who will be adventurous and accept their requests with open arms, or at least an open mind. Like Diogenes, forever in search of an honest man, males are forever in search of the woman who will fulfill all his fantasies. Huntresses, to get him to fall in love with you, be that woman. Now, hunters, it's a tad different for you. Yes, be playful, but make sure that whatever erotic activity you suggest, you personalize it to her. Technique number 24 for hunters. Be a passionate lover, specifically for her. Hunters, when suggesting sex, make her feel it's her you want. A woman doesn't want a man who is just plain horny. She wants a man who is wildly passionate for her. Avoid phrases like, let's do it, and substitute instead ideas like, let me make love to you. So much for generalities. When it comes to sex, the exception is more common than the rule. No two people are alike sexually. Over a period of ten years at the project, my colleagues and I examined data from men and women from every walk of life. Many thousands of letters flowed into the project, each detailing the sexual attitudes and assets they would like to have in an ideal partner. The diversity in sexual desires was astounding. Actually, I must admit, I learned about sexual diversity the first time I fell in love. 
even before our more scholarly research confirmed the variety. Some years ago, I was visiting an art gallery in Chicago. Christopher also happened to be visiting the Windy City that day and installing a show of his own art. I spotted him across the room, hanging a curious abstract canvas on the wall. I was instantly attracted to him. Everything about him fit my love map. He was artistic-looking, sensitive, brilliant, and he had lovely, lovely buns. We met, we hit it off, and fortunately he was from New York, too. We started dating back in the Big Apple. It wasn't long before I fell in love with Christopher, and of course I wanted to do everything I could to make him return the sentiment. My relationship with Christopher was almost ideal. We enjoyed the same activities, we liked the same friends, we both loved theater, skiing, and cycling. Sometimes we would stay awake all night talking. I felt Christopher was the one. As time went by, we fell into a wonderful love affair. But Christopher still never said, I love you. Everything else about our relationship was ideal, so I figured it must be the sex. Christopher never lost himself in the throes of passion. He didn't go wild in bed the way I'd read a man should when a woman really knew how to turn him on. Our sexual scenario was always the same. After dinner, usually at his apartment, we would be talking. Then at some point in our conversation, Christopher would get a cute little grin on his face, put his hand on my shoulder, slide it down my arm to my hand. He'd stand up, sometimes he'd wink, and he'd say, Come on, little girl. Then Christopher would lead me tentatively into the bedroom. He acted as though he had to proceed gently, cautiously with the seduction, as if I'd say no. Christopher's lovemaking was warm and loving, but also predictable and unpassionate. I figured that would change if I knew just how to push his buttons. I decided I needed to spice things up to make him fall in love with me, but I didn't know how. One afternoon, while pondering this dilemma, my eyes happened to fall on an ad in the Village Voice. It was for a seminar called How to Strip for Your Man. It promised to, quote, put some spice in your relationship and drive your man wild. Just what the love doctor ordered, I thought. I donned my sexiest underwear and hopped the A-train to the stripper's sixth-floor walk-up apartment in a cheesy suburb. That evening, in her one-room flat, four other women and I learned how to swivel out of our skirts, provocatively let them drop to the floor, and then step seductively out of them. We got step-by-step -step lessons in how to slide our bra straps down teasingly, flash first our left breast, then our right, then fling the discarded bra across the room as we gyrated our hips. She taught the more agile among us to stretch out on the floor and teasingly whirl our legs around in the air. At the end of the class, our teacher went into her back-of-the-room sales pitch. Optional purchases were a cassette of strippers' music and a set of tassels. The tassels twirled amazingly well on some of the more well-endowed students, but unfortunately my equipment was not sufficient to get one good spin out of them. However, I bought both products, and with the strains of the stripper dancing in my head— I took the train straight to Christopher's apartment. I couldn't wait for his cute little grin, because that was going to be my cue. Sure enough, about 10.45, the corners of his lips went up. Come on, little girl, he said, as he took my hand and we started toward the bedroom. But tonight was different. Tonight, little girl had a surprise for Christopher. The moment we entered his bedroom, I pushed my astonished lover into the chair. I slipped the cassette into his stereo, and I leaped promptly into my routine. A little fancy footwork around the dresser, one, two, three, va-va-voom, peek-a-boo, one breast, four, five, six, va-va-voom, peek-a-boo, the other breast, and then went my bra careening cup over cup across the bedroom, making a perfect two-point landing right in his lap. But our coach had left out one critical performance skill. It is crucial to keep a constant eye contact with your audience and to know how you are doing. As I was writhing around on Christopher's carpet, twirling my legs, dangerously near his favorite lamp, I might add, I neglected to look at his face. If I had, I would have seen a horrified expression. Christopher calmly stood up and walked out of the bedroom and out of his own apartment. In tears, I gathered up my skirt, my bra, my cassette, my unused tassels, and I ran all the way home. What went wrong? I didn't hear from Christopher for a week. Finally, I called him and said, Can we talk? We met for dinner, and talk we did. He was very forthright. I learned that Christopher's idea of sex was seducing a woman, not being seduced. Furthermore, his biggest turn-on, he told me, was not for the woman to be flamboyant and seductive, but to resist. 
Christopher, it turns out, wanted to feel like the virile seducer. Not, as he said, quote, some lonely repressed guy who pays to see cheap women dance around. Wow. What an eye-opener that was for me. I resolved at that moment never to make any assumptions about a man's sexual desires again. Every man is different, and so is every woman, and we'll talk about that later. On the surface, it may seem like all men want just one thing. But as I learned, there are many recipes to cook up that one thing. Let's go to the research. How did men's and women's sexual desires differ? Vastly when it came to their sexual fantasies and even more vastly in what role they wanted their partner to play in their fantasies. Essentially, men's fantasies were more extreme and diverse than women's. Their desires were more tied to specific acts and attitudes. Their fantasies were less connected to the personalities and the emotions of the partner. Often men's fantasies involved control, one partner over the other. One of the more intriguing findings was that men can suspend reality during the sex act and get off more on play acting than women. Like Alice Lost in Wonderland, a man can get lost in fantasy land. Huntresses, this does not mean that men do not crave caring, affection, and love. But when the bedroom door is closed and the lights go down, he wants to lose himself in total sensuality, i.e. have raw sex. And curiouser and curiouser, Alice would say, after several great sessions of raw sex, when no love is spoken of, a man's thoughts are more apt to turn to love. A woman's sexual fantasies, in contrast to a man's, were more complicated. Often they were tied to a partner, not necessarily the one she is in bed with, and emphasized the relationship between the people in the fantasy. A woman's erotic dreams involved her partner's feelings and her own physical and emotional responses to what was going on. Unlike men's fantasies, the mood and the ambience of the encounter played a bigger role. And unlike men... Women had less desire to share their sexual fantasies with a partner. Why are men's and women's fantasies so different? Why do women connect love and sex more closely than men? Anthropologists explain it in genetic terms. The female must fight to keep the family together so offspring can grow up and be fed and be protected. Sexologists explain it experientially. Like our personalities, our sexual persona and desires are formed in childhood, especially between the formative years of five and eight. During these years, little girls experience more affection than little boys. Mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, and even mommy and daddy's friends all cuddle and kiss little girls. Little girls sit on daddy's lap and hug him more than little boys do. So it is natural that she might have her first erotic feelings while being cuddled. Little boys are not cuddled and kissed as much. They experience affection in a different way. Maybe a pat on the back or a playful, hiya, buddy, punch on the shoulder. That expresses love to little boys. Little boys even learn to shun affection and kisses in public. Recently, I was walking past a city grade school about 8 o'clock in the evening. A mother came up to the school with her two children about 7 or 8 years old. She was holding her daughter's hand, and her son was bounding ahead of them. At the front door of the school, she bent down and gave her daughter a kiss and a big hug. The little girl threw her arms around her mother's neck and said, Bye-bye, Mommy, see you later, and she went bouncing off into the school. The mother then bent over her son to do the same. The little boy stiffened and put his hands up to shield his face. Mother, please don't kiss me while everybody is watching. The mother laughed and said, Okay, buddy, put up your dukes. They had a playful boxing match for a few seconds before the boy trounced happily along after his sister into the school. Little girls, when playing with each other, touch each other more. They braid each other's hair or put their arms around each other when they're afraid. Male friends are more apt to wrestle or shoot each other in a game of cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers. Is it any wonder, then, that girls grow up connecting love with kisses and cuddles and boys grow up connecting love with rough play or power games? The most striking difference, however, was not the actual fantasies. It was what men and women wanted to do with their sexual fantasies. It is curious to note, men's and women's fantasy desires were in direct contrast to their real-life stereotypes. In day-to-day -day matters, a woman usually likes to share sensitive information, and a man prefers to keep his thoughts to himself. However, in sex, many men want to share their sexual fantasies with a woman. Some even have a compelling desire to play-act them out with her. The Golden Rule tells us, Do unto others that which you would have done unto you. 
This is good advice with your co-workers, 9 to 5, daytime, and with your friends, 5 to 9 in the evening. But after you bring in the dog, put out the cat, switch off the lights, and hop into bed with your lover, forget it. Forget the golden rule once the two of you are under the sheets. The golden rule causes big problems in sex. Because all too often, a man has sex with a woman the way a man likes it, sometimes too crude, too quick, too unromantic. And women make love to a man the way a woman wants it, sometimes too slow, too romantic, too emotional. Once you're under the covers with the opposite sex, discard the golden rule like a dirty Kleenex. Now, obviously, reading sex manuals and popular books which highlight, emphasize, and underscore our differences have not done the trick. Men continue turning women off with their unromantic triple-X approaches, and women continue exasperating or boring men with their super-soft G needs. Here's help. Huntress is first. You must become a sexual sleuth, a detective in sex to find out what really turns your unique, particular, individual man on in bed. Most huntresses just wing it with what we used to call the, the Peter meter. They try this, they try that, then they watch his reaction. Or they do their research smack dab in the middle of the action by asking, Do you like this, honey? Does that feel good? Enterprising huntresses ask, Would you like anything else? Good, but not good enough. To turn up the sexual electricity, you must don your Sherlock Holmes cap, grab your magnifying glass, and slink stealthily through all the twists and turns of his sexual psyche. You must become a sexual sleuth and uncover his core fantasies. To extract a man's core sexual preferences, you must peel back the protective layers he spent years meticulously constructing around them. It's incredible how we casually ask a man about his taste in food, films, books, music, sports, hobbies. But we leave out the most important one of all. How often have you looked a man straight in the eyes and asked, What turns you on? Asking a man what turns him on requires a bit more finesse, however, than just blurting it out like, Hey, what's your favorite movie? You should carefully choose the time, the place, the atmosphere, and your attitude. The time should be a relaxed time, but not when sex is in the immediate picture. The place should be somewhere private, but not the bedroom. The atmosphere should be conducive to letting him talk, uninterrupted, for a long, long time. And your attitude should be playful, mischievous. Hopeful. Couch the question in a way that leaves no doubt in his mind that you are asking what really turns him on. That anything goes, the juicier the better. The goal is to get him to sing like a happy canary. If you want him to spill the beans, you must make your quarry feel safe giving you an honest answer to your question, what turns you on. Set the stage by letting him know that nothing would shock or turn you off. You will not be judgmental. You are a very open-minded woman. In fact, you enjoy far-out sex stories. File 11 You're almost at the end of our book. Now you can see that audiobook for free is a good idea. We are constantly looking for investment to produce more books, improve and expand our services, and generate more income for our contributors, shareholders and investors. Join us with your money and enjoy it. Technique number 25 for Huntresses. What turns you on? Huntresses purr mysteriously about how you like imaginative sex. Then, with a mischievous little grin on your face, ask him, Honey, what turns you on? His answer could be the golden egg guaranteed to get his goose and make him fall in love with you. You may come up with nothing, or you may unearth the key to his heart. But now be prepared to hear some of the most common male fantasies coming from his lips. What are the most common secret male fantasies? Research shows that it's fantasies of having sex with two women, seeing two women make love to each other, seeing a woman masturbate, having the woman take charge and give him sexual commands, dominating a woman. The list goes on. The list also gets increasingly more far out and esoteric. If there are any secret marbles in his little bag, he will now spill them out into your lap. 
thrilled that he is with such a free-spirited woman. Now, Huntresses, your work isn't over yet. Far from it. Whatever his answer to your what-turns-you-on question, feign excitement, put a twinkle in your eye and say, Oh, really? Then maybe bite your lip a little, trying to suppress your thrill and croon. Tell me more. Punctuate his monologue with appropriate oohs and ahs and sexy smiles. Your goal is getting him to continue talking about whatever turns him on. A few warnings. It is crucial, as he is sharing these intimacies with you, that you don't let one minuscule judgmental frown flicker across your brow. Most women are smart enough, when they see their lover's private parts for the first time, to know they shouldn't grimace or giggle. Well, when a man is sharing his fantasies with you, he is bearing his mental private parts. He is sensitive to your every expression. One disapproving look, and he zips his lip on this subject, maybe forever. Technique number 26 for Huntresses, the hot purr response. How should you respond when you get him talking about sex? An approving moan, a hot purr, and perhaps a naughty smile punctuated by a little licking of your lips is precisely what the X-rated Miss Manners suggests. Do all men have a sexual secret? No, of course not. But get ready for a pretty surprising statistic. Therapists report that about 90% of men have a secret desire they've never shared with their wives or significant others. Incidentally, the what-turns-you-on technique is a splendid method for finding out if the two of you are going to be sexually compatible in the long run. Some men have sexual habits and proclivities that are a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live with them. So suppose you're sitting across the restaurant table with a reflection of candlelight in the beautiful wine glass flickering off your expectant, smiling face. You've asked him, what turns you on? And he starts telling you some bizarre activity you could never accept. What should you do? Scream? Grab your bag and run? Say, ugh, that's disgusting, or what a sicko you are. No. Listen anyway. React as though what he's saying is exciting. You may run to the ladies' room and gag later if it's something you really find distasteful, but now is not the time to show it. You've led him this far down the garden path, and it's not fair to kick sand in his face. Incidentally, you must never share his secret with anyone else, even your best friend. You have tricked him into telling you, and now you must play fair. Chances are his secret will be something very ordinary. But if you want him to fall in love with you, it's up to you to make him think that you find his ordinary desires extraordinarily exciting. I once had to face that challenge. I met Charles at a party he and his roommate were giving. We hit it off instantly. He was a copywriter with a large advertising agency, and I was fascinated by him. We started dating, and it was headed toward a love relationship. But this time, I wasn't going to make the same mistake I had made with Christopher. One night at dinner, holding hands across the table, I purred, Charlie, what really turned you on? Sexually, I mean. A little taken aback by my question, he hemmed and hawed but I assured him I loved fantasy and really wanted to know, etc., etc., purr, purr. Well, Lily said, during sex, I've always fantasized being a chicken. A, a, a chicken, I gulped? Golly, that's, that's so exciting. Well, one thing led to another, and I wound up playing chicken with Charlie. The details of the game are too weird to go into here, but suffice it to say, because I really liked Charlie, it was kind of fun but not something I'd want as a steady diet. Charles and I broke up, but to this day, Charles still calls me. Fantasy fulfillment is that important to a man. Hunters, do these techniques work with women? Chalk it up to yet another drop in the ever-expanding ocean of gender differences. You will not thrill a woman if on your first date you embark upon an inquisition about her sexual fantasies. A woman would probably misinterpret your asking what turned you on too early in a relationship. You would sound crude. Additionally, women are more private about their fantasies and do not feel the same need to share them. You still need the answer to the crucial question, what turns you on? The goal is the same, gentlemen. The method is different. After you are into an intimate relationship with her, ask her, with caution, about previous relationships, what she liked, what she didn't. Proceed slowly and let her know your motivation. You are not being nosy. It's simply that because you are so thrilled with the pleasure she gives you, you want to reciprocate. 
Therefore, you'd like to know what has given her pleasure in the past. This opens the door for her to give you any gentle guidance or directions if she wants to. If you pick up that she prefers not to talk about it, however, don't press. Step softly. Tread gently. And if, from what she's willing to divulge, you can pick up some useful information on her sexual attitudes and preferences, you're ahead of the game. Gentlemen, whenever I ask a girlfriend what it is that sexually excites her about her current lover, I hear qualities like, He's brilliant. He's sensitive. He's responsible. He's honest. And a myriad of other qualities that you think have nothing to do with what goes on under the sheets. But those qualities add to her excitement over you even when the lights are out. Keep in mind that she is excited by you as more of a total package. Her sexuality is not as specific. Your technique between the sheets is important, but for a woman it runs much deeper than that. All of your wonderful qualities and actions, in bed and out, add to her excitement over you. Now here is yet another technique both hunters and huntresses can use to net their prey. However, I direct the next chapter to hunters because this one is more potent for you. It uncovers another kind of fantasy, a deeper one, which involves your quarry's psychosexual needs. Hunters, women too have hot sexual fantasies, intense sexual fantasies, recurring sexual fantasies. And gentlemen, if you manage to fulfill a woman's sexual fantasies, it's a big step in making her fall in love with you. But there is a greater leap you can take into her heart a more effective stride in achieving your goal, and that is to fulfill her relationship fantasies. As no two people have precisely the same sexual fantasies, no two people have precisely the same relationship fantasies. Again, a generalization to be sure, but like men have more specific sexual desires, women have more specific relationship desires. But according to the testimonies I received at the project, Many women have an unusual twist to how they want to be loved. Hunters, you may have met beautiful, accomplished women, women who could have anybody, and yet they are still alone. They tell their friends, the right man just hasn't come along yet. And for them, it's true. Because for them, the definition of the right man is very specific. It is important for a woman to be loved in the way she needs to be loved. Recently, I decided to add to the project's research by asking my girlfriends how they envisioned being loved. I was stunned by the diversity of their answers. One of my friends, Catherine, is 42, and she's never been married. We had this discussion, and she told me she wanted a man who would make her, quote, number one in his life. She wanted a man who would have no other people in his life who were more important to him than her. That included even past wives or current family members, like children. Catherine told me she realized this is difficult because most men of her age had been married before, and many had children. She said she broke up with her previous lover, Bill, because she felt he was too attached to his children by a previous marriage. Catherine knew her craving to be number one was unfair and irrational, but she couldn't let go of it. We talked more. She told me she had come from a turbulent, broken family. Catherine remembers one fearful moment standing in the living room, gripping her mother's hand. Her father was shouting at her mother as he walked out the door for the very last time. He said, You are not the number one priority in my life anymore. Goodbye. While telling me this, Catherine put her hands over her ears as to shut out the horror of her father's words. Seeing how moved I was by her story, Catherine shared an embarrassing secret with me. She said when she was dating Bill, she had an image of herself and Bill's two daughters by a previous marriage on a sinking raft. In her nightmare... Bill would come racing out in a small boat to rescue them. But there was room for only one other person in the boat. Who would he rescue? In fact, she admitted she once blatantly proposed this question to Bill. He rightfully said, Catherine, that is not a fair question. There are different kinds of love. You are the most important person to me in the woman category. But how can you compare that to love for my daughters? Bill was right, of course, and Catherine knew it but it still wasn't enough for her. As ashamed as she was of her illogical need, it didn't go away. The fact that Bill wouldn't tell her she was number one was a big factor in her breaking up with him. Catherine is now very much in love with a man named Dan. But Dan is more astute than Bill. 
He knows enough to say, Kathy, you are number one in my life. These words are like sexual trigger words to Catherine. She's hoping that Dan proposes to her. Some women's relationship fantasies are even more masochistic than Catherine's. Have you ever known a woman who always winds up with a, quote, bastard who treats her badly? This is such a common phenomenon that some men fear that nice guys finish last. And with those particular women, they do. The fortunate women are the ones who are more realistic and have no strange twists on their relationship fantasies. They simply want a man who is loving, good, kind, supportive, a good husband and father, who will adore them and never look at another woman and be faithful forever. Come to think of it, how realistic is that relationship fantasy? The studies tell us that women are more demanding than men in the qualities their partner must have. The recurring cry, there are no good men out there, does not literally mean there are no good men out there. It means there is a shortage of men who fill that particular woman's definition of good. And again, hunters, that definition is very subjective. File 12 Audiobookforfree.com would like publishers, authors, and literary agents to contribute texts of their books. We will record audiobooks based on those texts. We will generate audio advertising income. We will share this income with all contributors. Technique number 27. Love her like she needs to be loved. Hunters, to capture your quarry's heart, it's not enough just to make her feel loved. Figure how she needs to be loved. To what degree? For what qualities? Then make her feel loved in precisely the way she wants to be loved. It will help you beat out men who are stronger, handsomer, richer, and brighter than you. Love and being loved is that important to a woman. And now we come to unturning a final stone. Never let it be said that we left one pebble unturned in our exploration of how to make anyone fall in love with you. No thorough investigation would be complete without examining another passage to our quarry's heart, the nasal passage, or pheromones. What? Pheromones. Chemical body excretions. Body odors. There has been much talk in recent years of pheromones. In certain bugs and animals, pheromones have proven to be potent stuff indeed. Some bugs just gotta have it when they get an olfactory jolt, and when a female pig gets a whiff of pheromones emanating from a sweaty male pig, she spreads her nostrils, turns her rump up toward him, and oinks seductively. In human animals, sweat, foot odor, and vaginal fluids, the odors that Americans gratefully pay deodorant companies to wipe out would count as pheromones. Do they work? Do male body odors have the same effect on human females and vice versa? Well, Certain humans do respond to body odors. Many men like the scent of a woman's underarms. Napoleon reportedly sent a letter to his beloved Josephine imploring her, I will be arriving in Paris tomorrow. Don't wash. But today, the average wife would be more apt to send her pit-sniffing husband to a sex therapist. Scientists do what scientists do when they're unsure of something. They conduct experiments, which they did on pheromones. But when their human research subjects lay flat on their backs, Blaring their nostrils for science, nothing happened. Women who sniffed armpit pads that men had worn for several days did experience a slight change in their menstrual cycles, but they certainly reported no feelings of sexual attraction. I've conducted a little first-hand research in this area, but my own unscientific observation is that if you dab some pheromones behind each ear, you may indeed find some horny female bugs flying around your head. But no evidence to date proves to me that pheromones cause the same reactions in humans. The sense of smell, however, is a powerful attraction. And who knows? There's a whiff of evidence that they're on to something. At least enough to warrant one more technique. Technique 28. Who knows? N-O-S-E. Don't expect him or her to fall nose over heels in love with you just because of your scent. However, since pheromones play an important role in animal erotica, cover your bets. Give your relationship an olfactory boost by letting your quarry choose your perfume or aftershave for you.
let us now surface from the underground terrain of hidden fantasies and scientific substances to Main Street, every town, USA. Here's a problem that all men and women face when they're with their main squeeze. See if this has ever happened to you. A couple, Dick and Jane, that's you and your significant other, are happily strolling hand in hand along the sidewalk together. A gorgeous woman comes slinking towards them from the opposite direction. Rats, thinks Jane. I just bet Dick is going to look at her. He wouldn't dare. va 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 voom Dick thinks. What a dish. Whoops, I better not let Jane catch me looking at her. Well, I'll just keep my head straight ahead and strike when the iron is hot. I'll give my eyes a quickie as soon as she passes close to us. Dick and Jane keep walking, nonchalantly oblivious, of course, to the approaching dish. Dick smiles at Jane and gives her a hand a little squeeze for reassurance. Jane smiles contentedly. The dish gets closer and closer. This is Dick's window of opportunity. It's now or never. He lets his eyeball swivel her way for a split second. Did he get away with it? Not in a pig's eye. As far as Jane is concerned, Dick's eyeballs might as well have been hanging out and dangling by the optic nerve as the dish passed. Jane goes into a funk, or a bout of insecurity, or hits Dick with an original line like, What, you've never seen a woman before? Bad scene. Technique number 29 for hunters. No looky-dishy. Hunters, to win the heart of your quarry, don horse blinders whenever you're with her. Keep your eyeballs on a strict diet. In fact, pray that a dazzling dish walks your way, just so you can prove to your quarry how oblivious you are to other women and how you only have eyes for your own fair lady. Huntresses, now here's a trick for you to win the heart of your male quarry when the inevitable happens. Let me put this in the form of a legal argument. Whereas, all men enjoy looking at other women, no matter how much they pretend they don't. And whereas men love it when a woman gives them permission to do something they've really wanted to do all along, but felt they shouldn't. Therefore, to win the heart of your quarry, help him do what he wants to do all along. Give him guilt-free snacks. Point out the good-looking cookies. Make him look at other women. Point them out in the street, at the party, on television. Search for them in crowds and make sure your quarry doesn't miss a single one. How much more affection Dick would have felt for Jane if she had said as she spotted the advancing dish, Wow, Dick, you're going to like what's coming. Our last technique, technique number 30 for Huntresses. Looky dishy. Huntresses. Point out attractive women to your quarry to give him permission to look at them. Say things like, Now there's a woman with style, or even, Wow, is she pretty or what? If he's smart, he'll probably protest and mumble something about how you're better looking, but then he'll have his guilt-free gander, and you will have a much happier goose. A final word. We enter this world from our mother's womb, alone. We live our lives in a solitude defined by the boundary of our mind and our body, and we exit this earthly existence, unaccompanied. If, in between, two solitudes can find togetherness and communion with another mortal, they find true happiness indeed. But true love is a luxury, not our preordained birthright, and like achieving any luxury, we must examine the most powerful methods to acquire it. So we look to the scientific research to tell us why people fall in love. And then we fashion our deeds to meet the needs of the mortal we want to make fall in love with us. But, as the British poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote in a letter to one of his colleagues, I believe the souls of five hundred Sir Isaac Newtons would go into the making up of a Shakespeare or a Milton. So it is with love. Hearken the studies which tell us of the six elements we have explored. The impact of first impressions, the influence of similarity, the shrewd reckoning of equity, the narcissism of ego, the magnitude of gender differences, and the joy in the enrapturement of sex. Spike your arrow with this wisdom and the techniques that science has spawned. But as you take aim at your quarry, never forget the artistry, the creativity, 
the magic of love. A great performer studies techniques for a lifetime, but flooded by the warmth of the spotlight, the grueling years of practice fade into the past. Triumphant performers give themselves to the moment and let the magic unfold naturally. So it is with romance. Study and practice the techniques to make someone fall in love with you. But when the moment arrives, give yourself to it. Follow your instincts and obey your heart. I wish you love.